Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. The first of four criminal trials former President Trump is facing begins on Monday. If convicted, there's a chance the judge could imprison him. If that comes about, what would be the impact on American democracy and the national psyche at this critical time just ahead of a presidential election? The Biden administration said it will forgive over $7 billion more in student loan debt for over 200,000 borrowers. Details on the latest round of attempted loan cancellations. Senate Republicans are pushing for the impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. They sent a written demand to the majority leader. Temperature data is reportedly what drives climate-related policies. But one journalist reports that hundreds of non-active or non-existent temperature stations in the U.S. are given temperature readings. Find out why. The FBI director says it's crunch time with a growing threat of a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. The agency wants a surveillance tool renewed before it expires next week, saying it helps protect against terror. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb. I'm sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, former President Trump said he wants to debate President Biden as soon as possible. Trump called for earlier and more debates in the lead up to November. Trump did, did not debate his challengers during the GOP primary race, but in recent weeks he offered to debate Biden. Quote, anytime, anywhere, any place. Trump's top campaign advisors Thursday sent a letter to the Commission on Presidential Debates. It asked the Commission to move up its proposed dates to ensure more Americans have a chance to see the candidates before voting. The letter said the first of two debates in 2020 had anti-Trump moderator and asked for the 2024 debates to be, quote, truly fair and conducted impartially. Biden did not commit to debating Trump, but did not rule it out, saying last month it would depend on the former president's, quote, behavior. Former President Trump is trending upward in election polls in multi-candidate races in all swing states. He leads President Biden by between two and seven points. Entity's Daniel Monahan has more on the latest numbers plus analysis from a polling expert. Former President Trump's swing state lead is based on January to March poll averages of registered or likely voters listed by 538. When excluding third-party candidates, President Trump stays ahead of his opponent. But experts say there are some factors the polls may not reflect. Trafalgar Group's head pollster Robert Cahaley had the most accurate results, showing a Trump victory in 2016. He says Trump's hidden voters are one such factor. Trump's hidden voters are people who just won't say they're for Trump. He says the share is a bit smaller this year, and part of the hidden Trump vote is already reflected in the polls. Other sources of Trump's lead include more support from black, Latino, and young voters. Professor David Taylor, director of the Institute for Policy and Opinion Research at Virginia's Roanoke College, says a small lead doesn't always translate into victory. If someone has a 10-point lead, they're likely to win. If someone has a three-point lead, you're cautious. If you have a one-point lead, that's really a tie. Taylor also cautions voters from relying too much on single polls. There are five polls. Don't look at any one poll. Average them together, and that's going to give you the best sense of what the most likely outcome is, given all the information we have. Taylor says at the end of the day, a poll is just a snapshot of the demographic someone looked at at that point in time. It's the best guess, but, you know, if uh, something happens on the Saturday before the election where that might change people's opinions and votes, no poll is going to be able to capture that unless it starts Saturday or after. The polling expert adds that a rare event can change everything in an instant. The polls could still say someone's ahead by six, but they could lose by eight because of things like, you know, right now it's sunny, but... Uh, a tornado could appear in five minutes. Another important factor is voter turnout. Trafalgar Group's Robert Cahaley says Democrats are very good at getting people who really don't care about voting to turn out to vote. The pollster says it's pretty hard to poll somebody who was never planning to vote. 
On third-party candidates, Kahaley expects Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s candidacy to play a big role in this year's election. On average, Kennedy commands 10% of registered or likely voters in swing states. Kennedy is now only officially on the ballot in Utah, but his campaign says it has enough signatures for Hawaii, Idaho, Nevada, New Hampshire, and North Carolina, and is working on qualifying in other states. Kahaley believes that Kennedy has the resources to get on the ballot in most states, a move which could have a dramatic effect on results in November. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. And former President Trump's so-called hush money trial starts on Monday. As the world watches this historic event, we tune in to our news contributor, Mike Leon. Mike is also the policy and strategy director of the Free and Equal Elections Foundation and host of the news commentary podcast, Can We Please Talk? Mike, great to have you with us. This is the first of four criminal trials Trump is facing. And if convicted, there's a chance that the judge could imprison him. If that comes about, what would be the impact on American democracy and the national psyche at this critical time, you know, just ahead of a presidential election? Well, Steph, good to see you first and foremost. You know, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about what happened yesterday, where a person passed away in uh, O.J. Simpson, who had a famous trial in 1994. Again, somebody not running for public office, but the visibility of that trial and the verdict of that trial stayed with the American psyche for generations to come. And you can even see it in the obituaries, as it was mentioned afterwards. And I think You've seen polling data starting to show a little bit. There was an Axios, uh, Axios uh, article recently that had an Ipsos Reuters poll that mentioned about, you know, 60 percent of, of the respondents in that poll felt that this trial was serious. Now, there's two parts to this. There's the legal merits of the case itself, you know, with the statute of limitations. Some of this maybe rises to a felony or a misdemeanor, the, the amount of charges that the former president is facing. You can get into the legal breakdown of that and all. But the secondary part is the public perception. It's, it's what voters are looking at of seeing a former president in trial facing charges like you mentioned. And we're all going to be on pins and needles watching this because this may be the only trial that takes place across these jurisdictions before the election. And I think you're starting to see the polling say that this could have an impact in the way it is swaying voters. I'm interested to see how it plays out. But again, the legal merits of the case are are very shaky at best from former pr prosecutors that I have spoken to. So I'm interested to see how it plays out. But we would be remiss if we didn't talk about a trial that happened decades ago with somebody who just recently passed away and how that really swayed public perception about that person, even though that person never ran for office. Now we have somebody running for the highest office in the land that's facing a similar trial with consequences. For sure. And that, uh, you know, the on the passing of O.J. Simpson, it's, it is a good point to bring that up because that is the, the trial um, uh, was a huge part of how people also remembered him. And that came out in the forefront uh, yesterday. You mentioned this poll uh, by, by Ipsos. Um, it also, um, I guess I'm wondering what you think it could mean for national unity. Because uh, polling from last year also showed that Democrats more and more are seeing this, this trial as kind of more legally dubious. And yet it is, it is an issue that is so, so intense, you know, it could really divide people potentially. Yeah, I mean, legally dubious is a really good phrase because, uh, and again, uh, two parts to it, right, folks? Like for, for some people that are not versed in the legal community, maybe you don't watch court TV or law and order, I get it. Um, but there are some legal hurdles and challenges with this case that any lawyer, you know, whether it be a criminal defense attorney or whether it be a former federal or state prosecutor would look at it and say, Look, some of these charges don't rise to that level. Uh, prosecutors, at least ones that I've talked to, have said you don't stack on charges the way you don't overcharge, as one former federal prosecutor told me. And they felt that this was an overcharge with some of this. You know, for, for anybody else, this could potentially be the proverbial slap on the wrist, right? Like a misdemeanor. Um, and so I think the biggest takeaway for me is, and again, look at it from the independent voter mind, because Republicans, only four in 10 say that this trial means something and that it could be serious to the former president. That means 60% of the party doesn't agree with that. We know where Democrats stand on this. 
The biggest issue is where do independents stand on this? Because independents are going to sway this election. The package that just played before I came on, Steph, Mm. talked about third party candidates and where independent voters could be leaning and where some of the analytical trends are pointing to. Well, independent voters are going to watch this trial play out. It may be the only trial that happens involving the former president. He could be facing charges. I don't think he'll ever actually face any jail time given his age and he has no prior criminal record. But seeing a former president in court and obviously seeing the evidence come out against him, while wherever the evidence will stack and Alvin Bragg will present, is something that could sway independent voters. And they're going to be the large makeup of how this November general election will sway in either former President Trump's direction or current President Biden's direction. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, I also want to look at just very briefly. Oh, you know what? That's all we have time for just now. Thank you so much, Mike Leon. Great to have you with us. Thanks, Steph. Thanks for having me. All right. The Biden administration said today it's forgiving another round of student loan debt to the tune of $7.4 billion. The move will impact some 277,000 borrowers. It's part of a program enacted by the White House to make it easier for some specific groups of borrowers, like public sector workers, to qualify for loan forgiveness. The program also includes a repayment plan that creates a shorter pathway to loan forgiveness for many low-income borrowers. Republicans have sharply criticized the program. They argue the president is transferring the cost of student loan debt to taxpayers who chose not to go to college or who have already paid for it themselves. In total, the Biden administration has authorized the cancellation of around $150 billion in student loan debt for over 4 million people. That's more than 9% of all outstanding federal student loan debt. Former Vice President Mike Pence has a new job. A conservative Christian college in Pennsylvania says Pence has accepted a teaching position at the school. Grove City College made the announcement yesterday the same day Pence delivered the keynote address at the college's Institute for Faith and Freedom conference. The college says Pence will be a visiting fellow at its new Center for Faith and Public Life. Over his years in public office, Pence has been open about his faith, often referring to himself as, quote, a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. Up next, Denver continues cutting city services to support illegal immigrants. We have the details of the new plan showing where the money will come from. Twisters, torrential rains, and and washed out roads. The southeast was hit with multiple storms. We have video footage of the tempest wrecking havoc. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, ride your bike. If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. If you're happy and you know it, smile big and bright. Thousands of your kids just like me are happy every day. And it's all because of generous people like you who support Shriners Hospitals for Children every month. All you have to do is call the number on your screen or go online to loveshriners.org right now with your monthly gift. Because of people like you, Shriners Hospitals for Children is able to make an everyday miracle happen for kids like me. And when you call or go online right now to donate $19 a month or more, we'll send you this adorable Love to the Rescue blanket as a thank you and a reminder of all the smiles you're bringing to kids' faces every day. Will today be the day you send your love to the rescue? When you call the number on your screen right now and give as little as $19 a month, just 63 cents a day, you'll be making a life-changing difference for a child, just like Sarah. Your monthly gift today could change your life forever. Because of you. We are happy and we know it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please call or go online right now to give. If operators are busy, please wait patiently or go to loveshriners.org right away.
Did you know indoor air quality can be five to even 100 times worse than outdoors? Meet the Air Doctor. It's your answer for clean air and the only hospital grade air purifier equipped with advanced ultra HEPA filters proven to improve your indoor air quality and overall health. Air Doctor circulates and triple filters the air in your room up to five times per hour. Say goodbye to pollen, smoke, mold spores, pet dander, even viruses, because the Ultra HEPA filter removes virtually 100% of dangerous contaminants down to 0.003 microns. That's 100 times smaller filtration than ordinary HEPA purifiers. This would have been in your lungs. Finally, get relief from allergies and asthma and reduce airborne disease. It's pulling the pollutants out. It's even pulling the toxic chemicals that our cleaning products leave behind. Call or go to tryairdoctor40.com now. Get 40% off our best-selling air purifier. Call 1-800-876-0163. Call now. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Senate Republicans now demanding an impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This as Republicans fear Senate Democrats are not planning to hold the trial. House Republicans voted to impeach Mayorkas in February over his handling of the southern border. Forty-three Republican senators sent a letter yesterday to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. They say the Senate has almost always held trials when the House sent articles of impeachment. The letter states since 1797, 21 individuals have been impeached by the House of Representatives. Trials were held in every single instance except once. They added that illegal immigration has increased by over 400 percent in just three years. Six Republicans did not sign the letter. Some question whether the House has shown enough evidence for the impeachment. Homeland Security has denied accusations of wrongdoing by Mayorkas. A spokesperson previously said that the impeachment was conducted without any evidence against the secretary. Denver continues cutting services to aid illegal immigrants. Mayor Mike Johnston now says the city is allocating $90 million to care for the arriving immigrants. Out of the $90 million, the majority will go to housing, around $50 million. Uh, other costs include supportive services and transportation. The funds will come from cuts to services and supplies, capital funds and more. The largest reduction is from not filling 160 job vacancies, which is scheduled to bring in almost $20 million. The mayor on Wednesday said this plan proves the city can be compassionate while still being fiscally responsible. Powerful storms sweeping across parts of the U.S. yesterday. More than 65 million people faced the threat of severe weather. This comes just one day after much of the southeast was pummeled by strong winds and tornadoes. A door cam captured the moment a storm hit the town of St. Augustine yesterday, appending plants and lifting garden furniture. There's no crossing this washed out road. Two fierce storms hit Tallahassee, Florida on Wednesday and Thursday. The storms brought down more than 10 inches of rain, prompting flash floods and rescues of stranded people. In Louisiana, a tornado left a trail of destruction. Power lines snapped like twigs. A tangled mess of electric wires, tree branches, and debris. The twister ripped roofs off of buildings and left tens of thousands without power. In North Carolina, a home security video captured a possible tornado moving through a neighborhood near Charlotte yesterday. A tree, as you can see, battered by ferocious winds, can't hold on any longer. Its branches ripped off in the storm. By today, the bulk of the storms will have moved off the coast, but parts of New England could see flooding and hundreds of inactive or non-existent temperature stations are assigned temperatures. To find out how this affects climate trends and data, I spoke with Katie Spence, who reported on this for the Epic Times. Katie, welcome and thank you for joining us. Now, how many inactive or non-existent temperature stations are still assigned temperatures, and how does this exactly work? Yeah, thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. There are about 1,218 total stations in the US HCN network, and approximately 30% of those are said to be inactive. So I think that's around 360-ish 
stations that are no longer active. And what happens is since they are no longer there, like the stations are gone, they're not present. Um, NOAA fills in data from stations that are surrounding the gone station. It's called, they interpolate the data. So they take station data from surrounding stations and they use that to kind of get an average for what they think the station would have recorded. So why is this happening? And is there anything being done to fix this? Because this could um, alter the numbers, I'm assuming. It could alter the numbers, and that's one of the things I pointed out in the article that I wrote. Um, the reason it's being done is because NOAA wants continuity with how many stations it has. So it started out with 1,218. It wants to continue to have that number. Um, and so instead of closing the stations that um, either have problems with the equipment or don't have anyone to man them anymore, uh, they just use the interpolated data. And as detailed in your article, data from the United States Historical Climatology Network is used by experts and decision makers. So based on your reporting, Katie, how is this temperature data informing climate policies? Right. So this historical climate temperature data is what everyone uses when they look at historical temperatures. So if you're looking at trends, if you're looking at what happened prior to the Industrial Revolution, you're going to use this data. So if you're saying, well, the temperature is increasing by X amount since this time, you're going to look at those trends. So NOAA, I think it's important to point this out, NOAA is not using this network to give global temperatures now. This is a historical network and they have the temperature readings available for people who are looking at history and then making policies based on history. And Katie, um, on more on that, so what is the response to all this from the NOAA and the U.S. government? So when I talked to NOAA and asked them why they use interpolated data to fill in the missing stations, they said it's for people who want to look um, and do analysis based on a certain amount of stations over time. Um, so we don't know exactly how this data is being used by everyone. It would be nice to know, but we don't. We do know that policies are dependent on temperatures from the pre-industrial revolution because that's what the zero um, net zero is based on. All right. Well, Katie, thank you so much for joining with joining us. Um, this is very insightful. Great. Thanks for having me on. The Dallas Police Department says Kansas City Chiefs receiver Rasheed Rice turned himself in Thursday evening. He posted a $40,000 bond not long after. The 23-year-old surrender comes after police issued an arrest warrant for him. He is accused of being involved in a six-car chain reaction crash last month and fleeing the scene. No one was killed, but four people were treated for injuries. Rice faces multiple counts, including aggravated assault and collision involving injury. So far, no word yet from Rice's attorney. Up ahead, officials say Russian hackers stole U.S. government emails with Microsoft after accessing the tech giant servers. More on the breach forcing multiple U.S. agencies to shore up defenses. Today, Defense Department officials testify on President Biden's 2025 missile defense budget. We'll have the details soon when we return. Chief Division Counsel and DOJ have approved a no-knock breach. We want the subject to be on display. Doing the walk of shame, full visual impact. Any questions? Are we becoming a police state? We don't need to have a crime. What we need is a person to look at. And then we go find out what crime you did. FBI! Our focus is shifting. Our main priority as a bureau is going to be domestic terrorism. It really paints anybody who's right of center. If you're a pro-life, pro-family Catholic, they define you as radical. These are anti-government. We have freedom of religion and freedom of speech. Violent extremists, and they must be dealt with. We can do anything we want.
No young person should ever have to worry about having a safe place to sleep at night, or a warm meal to eat, or whether anyone cares about them. Like I grew up um, in poverty, and I actually became physically homeless uh, right after I had turned 16. I didn't have anywhere to sleep, and I didn't really have uh, friends or family that could support me. To be homeless as a teen, I didn't ask for that. One in 10 young adults will experience a form of homelessness this year, and that's unacceptable. But the good news is there is an organization making a big difference, Covenant House. For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month just 63 cents a day, you can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love. For over 50 years, Covenant House has been helping youth in crisis and giving them the support and tools they need to succeed in life. Without the Covenant House, I honestly could not tell you where I would be today. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. I would not be here today if it weren't for the kindness of strangers, people who donated to Covenant House so that they could support me when I couldn't support myself. I have no words to express how Covenant House changed my life. Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Your support makes the work of Covenant House possible. Call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. I'm Arian Pastar in South America, Brazil, and we are NTD News. FBI Director Christopher Wray is sounding the alarm about the possibility of a terrorist attack in the U.S. He says the FBI's concerns are growing about the threat of a coordinated attack, similar to the ISIS attack at a Russian concert hall last month. Wray urged Congress yesterday to reauthorize Section 702 of FISA, or the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Section 702 is set to expire next week. Entity's Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. We've seen the threat from foreign terrorists rise to a whole nother level after October 7th. FBI Director Christopher Wray told the House Budget Panel Thursday that it was crunch time with Section 702 of FISA set to expire next week. I would be hard pressed to think of a time where so many threats to our public safety and national security were so elevated all at once. Ray pressed lawmakers to renew the surveillance program, calling it an indispensable tool to help prevent terror attacks. So let me be clear, failure to reauthorize 702 or gutting it with some new kind of warrant requirement would be dangerous and put Americans' lives at risk. A procedural vote for a bill to renew Section 702 failed in the House Wednesday. 702 allows the government to collect communications of non-Americans outside the country without a warrant, but it also allows the FBI to gather communications of Americans in the process, which has sparked some pushback from lawmakers. House Speaker Mike Johnson called the program critically important. Written testimony by Ray says the FBI had roughly 4,000 international terrorism investigations open at the end of the last fiscal year. The FBI director asked the panel to help get the Bureau's budget back on track after its 2024 budget fell $500 million short. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The U.S. Cybersecurity Agency says Russian hackers have accessed Microsoft servers to steal emails between officials and the tech giant. The watchdog put out an emergency directive this week requiring agencies to change any logins that were taken. It also requires them to check into what else might be at risk. The directive warns the hackers were exploiting authentication details shared by email to try and break into Microsoft's customer systems. Multiple government agencies were breached, but CISA did not name which ones. CISA didn't describe the extent of any national security risk. It says the hackers might have gone after non-government groups, too. And today, Defense Department and military officials testify on President Biden's 2025 missile defense budget. The House Armed Services Committee reviewed the budget request for missile defense and missile defeat programs. Let's take a look at that. 
The meeting will come to order. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for your patience while we finished a vote series the last few minutes. Uh, first of all, before we do anything else, I'm going to ask unanimous consent that non-subcommittee members be allowed to participate in today's hearing. After all, subcommittee members have had an opportunity to ask questions. Is there any objection? If not, so ordered. So subcommittee, non-subcommittee members will be recognized at the appropriate time for five minutes. Welcome to our hearing. And uh, thank you, for witnesses, for being here. We have Mr. John Hill, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space and Missile Defense Policy. Joining him, we have Lieutenant General Thomas James, the Deputy Commander of the U.S. Space Command, Lieutenant General Heath Collins, the Director of the Missile Defense Agency, and Lieutenant General Sean Ganey, the Commander of U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command. The subcommittee meets today to review the department's fiscal year 2025 budget request for missile defense capabilities. I have a number of concerns just right off the bat here. First, the overall level of funding is inadequate given today's threat environment. The fiscal year 25 budget requests $10.4 billion for the Missile Defense Agency. That's more than $400 million less than last year and almost a billion dollars below the level projected for fiscal year 25 in last year's FIDEP. I want to reiterate this point. The fiscal year 25 budget request for the Missile Defense Agency is $960 million, almost a billion dollars, below the level planned for in last year's budget. Further, these draconian cuts are not limited to just fiscal year 25. The out-year spending projections included in this budget envision continued reductions in missile defense spending. Compared to the spending plan in the budget submitted last year, this budget forecasts cutting over $2.6 billion in missile defense funding between fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 28. To achieve these cuts, this budget would, made, would make several concerning decisions, including terminating the production line for SM3 Block 1B uh, interceptor and eliminating competition by prematurely down-selecting to single contractors on both the Next Generation Interceptor and Glide Phase Interceptor programs. I know we'll get into these issues in greater detail, but in the case of the guide, excuse me, Glide Phase Interceptor, I think it's important to note that this down selection is occurring five years earlier than planned and before the preliminary design review is even held. I'm extremely concerned that we will simply not have enough sufficient technical data to make an informed choice between competing concepts for this program. The glide phase interceptor is the only capability in development specifically designed to com combat the growing hypersonic threats we face. It is vitally important to our national security that we get this program right. We should be investing in a robust program that delivers an effective capability to our warfighters on a schedule that meets the threat. That is why Congress mandated in Section 1666 of last year's Defense Authorization Bill, but this budget would do the opposite. Overall, I'm concerned that these decisions simply accept too much risk and that missile defense appears to have become a bill payer, bill payer for other capabilities in this budget. This is difficult to understand given the growth in missile threats the extremely high demand for de missile defense capabilities from combatant commanders, and the visible evidence of the value these capabilities bring to the fight on full display as we speak in the Red Sea and in Israel and Ukraine. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses about how this budget impacts their programs and their assessment of the risks contained in this budget. With that, I turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I'll, I'll just begin by echoing many of your concerns. Uh, this is obviously a time when missile defense is in use all around the globe, including by the United States, uh, in great, great quantity. Uh, this is not a, uh, a technology that seems to be, be fading away, and I think my biggest concern is that I just don't understand the rationale behind uh, many of these cuts. 
Now, I've asked a, a lot of tough questions of uh, leaders like yourself, Mr. Hill in particular, about uh, the purpose of hypersonics. It's in that same vein. We don't understand what exactly the operational concept is to use hypersonics. That makes us hard to understand the money we're spending on it. Well, likewise, as the chairman said, uh, if we don't understand why, or we don't understand the rationale behind these cuts, it becomes very hard to support them, especially in this environment. I want to uh, welcome both Lieutenant General James and Lieutenant General Collins, as this is the first opportunity to testify in, in front of the sub subcommittee uh, in your new roles. Lieutenant General James, Space Command's role is increasing in both importance and consequence, and given that Space Command was recently given responsibility for department-level missile defense coordination, it's critical that you and we understand the complex strategic role missile defense plays in our national security. You are the first Army space operator to reach the rank of Lieutenant General, so you must be doing something right. Uh, FA-40s have been an exemplar in the department, and this milestone is well overdue, so congratulations. Uh, Lieutenant General Collins, uh, your unique background across the spectrum of strategic programs, including space, nuclear weapons, and missile defense, makes you well prepared to be director of the Missile Defense Agency. I'm encouraged by our initial discussions that it is imperative that we understand the larger policy implications of what MDA is developing before we blindly build new systems that could inadvertently further the proliferation of missile technology or, in the absolute worst case, result in destabilization, miscalculation, and escalation to nuclear war. As I shift to the topic of today's hearing, I want to remind the subcommittee that missile defense has a mixed legacy and continues to pose difficult questions about what its purpose is and should be, under what conditions it actually makes us safer, and how much and what kind of it we need. That's why these questions, including what the chairman started with, are so important. As I laid out last year, there are five basic scenarios or levels at which we consider uh, using or not using missile defense. Behind me is a graphic depicting these levels, which I will use to frame uh, the rest of my remarks. The highest level of missile defense, it has been longstanding policy across nearly every administration that we are not and will not pursue missile defense to defeat a near-peer nuclear attack. Despite attempts to change U.S. policy during last year's NDA cycle to specifically do so, going down this road would be incredibly destabilizing, technically challenging, and prohibitively expensive. Until we can safely rid the world of all nuclear weapons, which I believe is ultimately necessary for the survival of humanity itself, we can neither unilaterally disarm nor unilaterally render useless our adversaries' arsenals. If we were to try to render all of our adversaries' missiles incapable through increased missile defenses, they would simply do what they have arguably already done, develop new, more complex missiles to defeat those systems. Mutually assured destruction sounds like a crazy concept when you first read about it, but it's fundamentally kept us safe. The fourth level of missile defense is the area where there is the most debate. This is where we can argue that our advancements in missile defense over the past two decades since pulling out of the ABM treaty have provided a greater security blanket against aspiring nuclear powers like North Korea and Iran. However, as North Korea, the DPRK, continues to expand their miss ballistic missile and nuclear arsenals, we must continually continually evaluate when we view them as more of a strategic level threat and therefore rely on a policy of nuclear deterrence instead of simply trying to outnumber their ICBMs with interceptors, such as the Next Generation Interceptor Program intends to do. If we decide to continue to outpace their ballistic missile expansion, the question is how do Russia and China respond? I've argued that they will certainly see that growth as directly affecting the credibility of their own nuclear forces, which may have dire unintended consequences. I hope that in today's discussion, uh, Mr. Hill, you can help us understand how the department continues to weigh those questions and that balance. As this subcommittee evaluates this year's budget request and the continued missile defense policy and posture of the United States, we must understand these implications for ensuring the strategic stability of America and the world for decades to come. Now, level three is a nuance that I think is important to distinguish from a rogue nation because the size of the system required to deal with it is very different, but continuing to have some capability to defend against a small, even single accidental launch should be maintained. 
At level two, the tactical level, the incredible support Ukraine has received from allies and partners in air and missile defense has enabled them to fight back against near nonstop Russian missile attacks for the past three years. Through, though if this body cannot get its act together and pass the languishing supplemental, this is the area in which Ukraine will suffer the most and will have direct impacts on their ability to maintain their sovereign country and territory. In the Red Sea, we are seeing what many thought was not possible, multinational, coordinated, and effective missile defense. And obviously, this is using a lot of missiles, which is one of the questions we have about reducing the budget. While U.S. Navy ships have been at the center of defending deployed forces, allies, partners, and commercial shipping vessels from a wide range of air breathing and ballistic missile threats, they have been working across a multinational task force. The French, German, and U.K. navies have all intercepted targets in the Red Sea. The 2024 NTD Night International Chinese Vocal Competition is scheduled to take place at Merkin Hall Kaufman Music Center in New York from September 18th to 21st. The competition specially invites vocalists from the world-famous Shen Yun Performing Arts to serve as judges. The prestigious gold award is $10,000. Chinese vocal artists aged 18 to 50 are welcome to register. A performance that truly matters. For each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun. Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her, and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation, but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from, I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic, and for a lot of people right now, the whole world is very, very chaotic, so I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. I'm Iris Tao at the White House, and we are NTD. Welcome back. We're continuing to look at a House Armed Services Committee hearing. Defense Department and military officials testified on President Biden's missile defense budget. Let's take a look at the hearing on the 2025 budget request for missile defense and missile defeat programs. Seeing cap uh, conditions like these acceptable to you, and how do deficient testing standards pose a threat to our national security? Congressman, thank you for the uh, question. Uh, White Sand Missile Range remains an integral part, as you know, to our testing in uh, the Army's Air and Missile Defense Program. As the senior mission commander uh, for Kwajalein Atoll, I also have uh, strategic testing at those sites where I also maintain an infrastructure uh, and sensors to be able to get after that. And I uh, 
believe continuing funding and improvements of all of those capabilities are critical to continue to ensure that we have the best capability as we test our critical systems moving forward. Thank you so much. And in New Mexico, as you know, Lieutenant General, we have a long legacy of not uh, just missile testing, but a lot of research and development that has contributed uh, to the strength of this nation's national security. We also have a toxic legacy uh, of impacts to the local surrounding communities from testing activities, which is one of the reasons I'm fighting and others here in Congress are fighting uh, to reauthorize RECA. And so we just want to make sure that those technologies are updated and that we don't make the same mistakes of the past. Uh, at the same time protecting national security. Now, Mr. Hill, given the importance of White Sands testing capabilities, uh, what is stopping the department currently from updating these critical testing systems? Uh, Congressman Vasquez, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specific decisions on, on those, but um, we can certainly take the question. Uh, and in the general sense, obviously, the pr previous discussions about the overall top line and making trade-offs within fi finite resources, I'm sure, is part of the part of the calculation that's happening. Thank you, Mr. Hill. I appreciate uh, you paying attention to this issue in, in future budget requests. Now, beyond the missile testing and evaluation done at White Sands, we're also home to the largest manufacturer of space-grade solar cells that are a key component to providing power to our satellites. Producers in my district power a significant portion of our nation's national security satellites directly contributing to the strength of our missile warning fleet in space. Uh, Mr. Hill, for components like solar cells that are critical for our missile defense and warning infrastructure, what does it mean to the department to have a reliable domestic supply chain and how can Congress help support robust production capabilities like those in my state? I think these reliable domestic production chains, we, f we see how important they are across a number of fields. Uh, one of the things that we've done, this re most recently issued our commercial space integration strategy, recognizing how much innovation is being driven by the commercial side of space. And, and the understanding that we in the Defense Department need to shift from trying to contort them into meeting our requirements to being flexible about our requirements so we can leverage what they're doing. That would be an example of Le creating an environment in which more innovation happens inside domestic production uh, capacity. I appreciate that, Mr. Hill, and we certainly are at the forefront, I think, of that uh, commercial commercialization, both in the research and development phase, but also now in light assembly and manufacturing when it comes to all these different components that are going into these modern uh, systems. And I appreciate your continued attention and investment to New Mexico Second District. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Representative Strong. Thank you, Chairman Lamborn and uh, Ranking Member Moulton, and uh, thank each of you for being here today. Uh, General, it was great having each of you in my office last week. It was interesting to learn that not only is Huntsville the rocket city, but it's also apparently the city of love, since uh, uh, this is where you met your wife, General uh, James, and uh, I also found out that General Ganey's parents met at Redstone Arsenal, so uh, it was interesting to hear that. Redstone Arsenal is truly making a name for itself. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. We've got some great things coming out of Huntsville. General Collins just a few weeks ago, General Geo with Northcom reconfirmed uh, to uh, this committee that the next generation interceptor is critical for defending the homeland. Last spring, your predecessor testified to the benefits of keeping multiple contractors on the NGI program through critical design review. Uh, but since uh, late last year, we've learned that this is uh, no longer the plan. Uh, this really concerns me and many others. Looking back to 2019, when the uh, redesigned uh, kill vehicle RKV program was canceled, we had all our eggs in one basket. There wasn't a backup plan. And because we didn't have a backup plan, we had to extend the life of our interceptors and start an entirely new program. This cost taxpayers a lot of money, it cost us capability, and it cost us time when there's a ticking clock over in the Indo-Pacific and throughout the world. What changed? Why is MDA now making an earlier uh, than planned down select decision before critical design review next year? Congressman, thanks for, for that question on NGI. Uh, it is absolutely our foundation for Homeland Defense uh, into the future, and uh, we have uh, continued to focus uh, the agency very much on NGI and its incorporation uh, in uh, no later than 2028. 
Uh, two things of note, I, one, one we've talked about is uh, certainly the fiscal uh, realities uh, and the decisions that needed to be made uh, with uh, across the, the missile defense portfolio uh, has been far reaching. Uh, but second, we've also been keeping the NGI program on track. Both primes have completed a preliminary design review. Uh, both have completed full qualification of all their parts for uh, the radiation environment. And many of the subcomponents uh, have been taken to the critical design review stage uh, of design. Uh, all that brought together, we, the agency, believe uh, we have a full in-depth understanding of the designs uh, from the two primes. Uh, we fully understand and uh, the uh, transition to production plans and the risks that are still involved with both primes. And we believe that the level of risk is uh, well below uh, the department's standard of making a decision such as this. So we believe we have the technical depth uh, and knowledge and understanding of risk as we move forward uh, to make that decision. Thank you. I know that some very smart people have done great work to keep our current interceptors in the game longer, but we cannot keep life extending the fleet. Is that right? That is correct, sir. Thank you. I know that the uh, confidence in NGI succeeding is high. I credit a big part of that to the incredible uh, work being done at Redstone Arsenal with both uh, uh, industry teams in Huntsville, Alabama. But the consequences of something going wrong with NGI are much higher now than it was back in 2019. Would that be a correct statement? Yes, sir. There is still additional risk ahead of us uh, on the program, and we will continue to stay very focused on where that risk is. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, we will continue to stay focused on where that risk is and uh, focused on mitigating that risk as best as possible. I totally, I totally agree. Um, they're more, much higher uh, this time because just um, uh, as you said, uh, we can't fall back on doing another life extension of the current system. We've already used uh, our get out of jail free card with the uh, uh, RKV. I worry that the Biden administration is uh, wanting to dismantle the significant industrial cap uh, capacity that has um, been built up over decades, and MDA's budget and plans are taking a detrimental hit due to some short-sighted uh, decisions here. Is there a report or study that MDA has conducted that supports down-selecting before critical design review over uh, sticking with the original acquisition strategy? No, sir, we do not have any uh, report or assessment on that. Thank you. Uh, so we're so were budget constraints the primary uh, or initial reason for the change in strategy, or is it because the team uh, the teams have progressed better than expected? I'd say, sir, it's a combination of both. Uh, both team both teams have pro pro progressed very very well, uh, but there was a catalyst that was driven by the fiscal decision as well. I thank each of you for being here, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Representative Carbajal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, hearing all the nexus that you have to Representative Strong's uh, district and not Paradise, which is my district, makes me start questioning your judgment, I must say. Um, we know our adversaries possess hypersonic capabilities. Defending against and defeating this threat is proving to be challenging, both technically and, phys and physically. General Collins, how are our advanced manufacturing technologies, such as additive manufacturing, being utilized to reduce costs and acquisition timelines for future hypersonic defense programs? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, and fully uh, agree with your, your, uh, your notes on the difficulty in developing an industry base to, uh, to accelerate our hypersonic offensive and defensive weapons as we move forward. Uh, and uh, in my previous job within the Air Force buying hypersonic weapons, we had the same challenge is, is developing the industry base to produce the critical technologies we require for hypersonic weapons. Uh, at the Missile Defense Agency, we're very focused on bringing any of the new advanced manufacturing uh, capabilities and technologies to bear uh, to help, one, reduce, uh, reduce cost uh, of, of building hypersonic weapons in the future, as well helping to scale and increase pace of, of capacity of, of, in, of, of lines going forward. Uh, we're very much looking into advanced manufacturing, additive manufacturing. As you mentioned, we have a group uh, within our S&T division uh, that is closely looking at and investing in small business 
uh, maturation capabilities of additive manufacturing and particular capabilities that are required within a hypersonic weapon. Uh, one in particular is carbon-carbon uh, um, additive manufacturing, which is key to the front edge thermal protection systems of our hypersonic weapons, a key technology and a, lim a limiting factor within our ability to scale uh, the industry base. And so we're very much investing across uh, the traditional and non-traditional bases to, in to ensure we have the manufacturing capability for hypersonic weapons. And for round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. Stay with us and we'll bring you more in the next two hours. What if you could whiten your teeth by simply brushing your teeth? Now you can with Smile Actives, the teeth whitening breakthrough that safely gets your teeth white and keeps them white every day just by brushing your teeth. I never thought that whitening my teeth could be so easy. I just put the gel on the brush, the toothpaste on it, brush, and I can see my white teeth. Simply add Smile Actives to any toothpaste and our patented PolyClean technology activates into a powerful microfoam that penetrates into the enamel surface to safely lift and remove stains. You need a simple way to whiten your teeth without strips, without trays, without going to the dentist. And it was about time that a product was developed that you would be able to do that with just brushing. And now Smile Actives is even better with new Pro Whitening Gel with 33% greater whitening power, clinically shown to whiten teeth faster, up to eight shades. 100% of users saw whiter teeth on food stains, coffee and wine stains, even on veneers, crowns, and dentures. I eat the blueberries, I drink the coffee, and I know that Smile Actives will keep my teeth white every day. If you could use something so easy like Smile Actives to take yellow teeth to white teeth, why wouldn't you? Why spend hundreds of dollars for whitening treatments at the dentist when now you can whiten your teeth with new Smile Actives Pro Whitening Gel every time you brush your teeth? Call or go to SmileActives.com and for a limited time, get new Pro Whitening Gel for just $24.95. Order in the next five minutes and buy one, get one absolutely free for just $24.95. That's two for one and save 58%. We'll even include free shipping. Get your teeth whiter guaranteed or return it within 60 days for your money back. I smile every day now. <laughs> The difference is literally night and day. So now I'm always smiling, always choosing, because now my teeth are much whiter. This offer is not available in stores, so call or click now before the special buy one, get one free offer goes away. When I drink it, the first thing was it, I feel the warmth in my, in my tummy. It's kind of like it's gently radiating out, you know, a kind of a very comforting warm. And it was really good, actually. I felt... Uh, uh, much better. I did feel actually an effect and I find that it is actually better when I take it regularly. It's actually steamed and dried nine times and so it's really, the essence is really extracted. Then the second time I tried it really like on an empty stomach and just just two, two teaspoons of it and over a few times and wow that was a big difference because suddenly I could feel why? I was very good energized. I didn't have to eat. I could work outside in the garden for a couple of hours, and I still felt very well. And I was impressed by that. So I think it's a good product. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD.
Welcome to NTD News Today. Here are today's top stories. An unprecedented meeting with top officials from the Philippines. Find out more about what they say about the Chi South China Sea. The Biden administration said it will forgive over $7 billion more in student loan debt for over 200,000 borrowers. Details on the latest round of attempted loan cancellations. Football great O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted of murdering his wife in 1995, is dead at 76. We hear people's reactions to his passing. A state's ban on cross-sex procedures for minors, the first of its kind in the nation, is back in the courtroom. More on the Arkansas case. San Francisco looking to deepen ties with the communist Chinese government, but the city's economy still sluggish post-pandemic. More on the mayor's trip to China. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb. I'm sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, former President Trump said he wants to debate President Biden as soon as possible. Trump called for earlier and more debates in the lead up to November. Trump did not debate his challengers during the GOP primary race, but in recent weeks, he offered to debate Biden quote, anytime, anywhere, any place. Trump's top campaign advisors Thursday sent a letter to the Commission on Presidential Debates. It asked the commission to move up its proposed debates to ensure more Americans have a chance to see the candidates before voting. The letter said the first of two debates in 2020 had an anti-Trump moderator and asked for the 2024 debates to be, quote, truly fair and conducted impartially. Biden did not commit to debating Trump but did not rule it out either, saying last month it would depend on former president's, quote, behavior. And the Biden administration said today it's forgiving another round of student loan debt to the tune of $7.4 billion. The move will impact some 277,000 borrowers. It's part of a program enacted by the White House to make it easier for some specific groups of borrowers, like public sector workers, to qualify for loan forgiveness. The program also includes a repayment plan that creates a shorter pathway to loan forgiveness for many low-income borrowers. Republicans have sharply criticized the program. They argue the president is transferring the cost of student loan debt to taxpayers who chose not to go to college or who have already paid for it themselves. In total, the Biden administration has authorized the cancellation of around $150 billion in student loan debt for over 4 million people. That's more than 9% of all outstanding federal student loan debt. And top officials from the U.S. and Philippines are meeting at the State Department. Top on their agenda is the dispute over the South China Sea. But uh, more importantly is we, we are determined to uh, assert our sovereign rights, especially within our economic, uh, exclusive economic zone, uh, and in accordance with the uh, UNCLOS and the arbitral ruling. The meeting includes defense and foreign secretaries from the two countries and their national security advisors. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the U.S. is in lockstep with the Philippines against coercion in the South China Sea. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the two nations have sh a shared commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, including in the South China Sea. The meeting came a day after the leaders of the U.S., Japan and the Philippines met at the White House. Hours earlier, the Chinese regime summoned Japanese and Philippine diplomats to express dissatisfaction over the Thursday summit. And uh, President Biden says that the U.S. commitment to its Pacific allies in that region is ironclad. He had the leaders, as we just heard, of Japan and the Philippines together yesterday discussing defense and peace in the region. To discuss this, we're joined by James Gari, author of The China Crisis and an Epic Times contributor. James, welcome. Big on the agenda, this meeting was how to counter China. What does this partnership yep. and the timing of it signal to you about the geopolitical climate? Well, the timing is, is because it's necessary. And the reason it's necessary is because the U.S. Uh, naval strength as a whole and its position in the South China Sea is, is weaker than it has ever been. So, uh, and China is stronger. So the timing is that, it, look, China has been able to, as, as the Pentagon points out, China has been able to impose its will 
with its formidable navy in, in the South China Sea and, and pretty much get what it wants to, whatever it wants. So, so how do we the get, timing is... Hmm. Go ahead. How, how do we Go get ahead. to this point of being weaker than China in terms of the military? Uh, well, the, the successive administrations, the Trump administration perhaps notwithstanding, have continually degraded our naval, uh, our naval ship uh, count and our naval fighting capacity. Um, the Biden administration just recently eliminated electronic warfare uh, systems uh, in the South China Sea. They're just getting rid of it. The Growler ATEM, I think it is. Uh, and we're continuing to reduce ships while China's continually adding ships. And there is pretty much a consensus that the U.S. is no longer the dominant Navy in the region, certainly not in the world in terms of uh, ship count. And the Pentagon has actually described China's Navy is modern and, and, and uh, highly capable and very flexible. It strikes me as significant that these, this uh, reduction in the military capability hasn't made headlines over the years. Uh, but I do want to look at uh, how these three countries that you know, met yesterday, the US, the Philippines, Japan, could best leverage their partnership to defeat China's aggression in that region, in your view. Sure. Uh, well, Japan has known about this for several years. In fact, in 2022, they issued a white paper, security paper, which is unheard of by the Japanese. You usually pretty close, uh, keep that close to the vest. But they announced that they're tying their security directly to that of Taiwan's. And uh, so that attack on Taiwan by China would be considered attack on Japan. Japan would go to their defense. Now, in order to actually make good on that uh, security claim, uh, Japan is reconfiguring its entire defense posture and towards a more offensive one and is coordinating closely with the U.S. on how to arrange that military industrial complex to accomplish that. So there's, that cooperation has been going on for at least a year or two. Uh, as far as the Philippines are concerned, I would imagine uh, it's allowing more forward positioning, expanding base access uh, among those islands there at least. Okay, so what, if any, vulnerabilities do you see uh, that the U.S. should be mindful of in this endeavor? Well, eliminating our ability to conduct electronic warfare and support mm -hmm. uh, forces in the, in the region, that's certainly a vulnerability. Yeah. Um, it, it may also be a vulnerability where we're placing the troops in the wrong place, like at Kinmen Island, 2.5 miles away from the uh, mainland China. I don't know how defendable they are, and I don't know how strategic they are. So China has some very strategic uh, assets that we can't defend against, namely the hypersonic missiles in the area. So that's a vulnerability. The anti-ship missiles could take out a lot of our ships without really having a, a definitive defense against them. So there's how all kinds of, of defense uh, some vulnerabilities that could uh, seen and known and unknown. So, James, how does this reduction in military capability fly under the radar? I, d I don't think it's something that Americans would really stand for if they really knew about it. Well, you know, it's, you, you focus on pronouns and um, um, other types of social programs, and that's your constituency, and you, you, don't, you, you don't publicize it. Now, folks in the defense establishment and people who, who fo follow it, they certainly know about it. Um, the rest of the world certainly knows about it as well. And it's quite clear that the U.S. security guarantees um, and um, follow through aren't what they used to be. Hmm. And Japan is well aware of it, as are the Philippines. So just look, lastly, this is really a question about weakness. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, no problem. No, so just lastly, James, what do, you, what do you expect to come of this new strengthened partnership uh, between Japan and the Philippines and the U.S.? Um, I expect that there will be, well, it's, it's calling for much more coordination. Um, that remains to be seen how well that's pulled off and how well the, the administration, uh, for whatever time it may have left, or, um, continues to uh, coordinate well and, and provide the things that are needed. I mean, if okay. it's pulling out certain ships and electronic warfare, then All what right. kind of capabilities will they supply? I don't know. Remains yes. to be seen. And as you said, it's a, it's a very intense time, so we'll be watching to see uh, how, how the partnership, you know, ends up working in the region. Thank you so much, James Gari. My pleasure. A show of force aimed at China. The U.S., Japan, and South Korea wrapping up a three-day drill in the East China Sea today. The exercises got underway as President Biden hosted leaders of Japan and the Philippines. Their conversation focused on Beijing's rising aggression in disputed waters.
I, I would once again just reiterate that uh, the United States, working with our allies in the regions, that uh, South Korea and uh, Japan are well prepared, well postured to defend ourselves and to defend our, defend our allies. The exercises involved a number of U.S. and South Korean missile destroyers and a Japanese warship. This comes after China's rising aggression in the South China Sea. Chinese Coast Guard ships have rammed Filipino boats, fired water cannons at them, and directed lasers at their crew members, all because of territory disputes. House Speaker Mike Johnson and former President Trump will deliver remarks on election integrity at Mar-a-Lago today. The meeting comes after disagreements between Johnson and Trump on issues such as aid to Ukraine and the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The meeting will reportedly involve a major announcement on election integrity and legislation to ban non-citizen voting. Federal law currently bans non-citizens from voting in federal elections. The event comes amid a looming threat from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene to force a vote to unseat Johnson as House Speaker. Greene has criticized Johnson for negotiating with Democrats on the recent spending bills. Despite the tension, it's expected that Trump will support Johnson who defended him during the impeachment trials. Coming up, football great O.J. Simpson, acquitted of murdering his wife in 1995, dead at 76. We hear people's reactions to his passing. Members of Congress representing Maryland are seeking 100% coverage for the Baltimore Bridge disaster from the federal government. That story and more coming up after the break. Tired of scrolling Netflix? Trying to find something that's worth watching? Want to skip the censorship in mainstream media? Well, now you can with Epic TV. New exclusive content every day with over 100 never before seen movies, films, and documentaries. Available and streaming now at your fingertips. For a limited time now, you can get 60% off Epic TV by subscribing or upgrading to a yearly plan. Plus, get an additional $10 credit to rent featured movies on Epic Cinema today. Skip mainstream narratives and find quality family entertainment from the comfort of your very own home. Say no to big tech and subscribe to Epic TV. by Jackie. I'm 44 years old. I had three kids at the time and single mother. I was working 60 hours a week. Still couldn't pay the bills. I'd skip meals so that they could eat. It's been hard because one thing falls into place, 10 things fall out of place. You know, I just can't do this alone and, and make it work. One in five children face hunger in America and food costs are rising, but everyone needs nourishing food to thrive. And they can when we work together so our neighbors can feed their families. Call or go online right now to join Feeding America with your gift of just $19 a month, only 63 cents a day. Together, thanks to a nationwide network of food banks, dedicated volunteers, and the monthly support of people like you, we can fill plates with nutritious food for families across America. One day my mother came over to my house and said, there's a meeting at the pantry. I said, okay, and I went. There were some ladies in there. They were from the food bank. They asked several questions. <laughs> some of those were about me and my story, but it helped me to open up a little bit. We're getting closer to the day when no one in America faces hunger, but we can't do it without you. Call or go online now. Visit helpfeedingamerica.org and give $19 a month, just 63 cents a day. 98% of donations go directly to help millions of people facing hunger from coast to coast and in your own community. And when you give by credit card, we'll send you this exclusive canvas grocery bag to show you are a part of a movement of supporters working together to help end hunger. I have people that I can trust. I have, I have hope. Please call now or make your monthly donation at helpfeedingamerica.org. Working together, we can end hunger in America. Join us on NTD Good Morning because we want you to stay informed. 
Kickstart your morning with the latest you missed overnight. Right, and don't forget that inspiration. Absolutely, so let's shine some light on the good news too. Tune in every weekday morning to NTD News. Welcome back. O.J. Simpson, the NFL star and actor who was acquitted in a sensational 1995 trial over the murder of his former wife, has died at the age of 76. We have reactions to his passing. I went to USC when he was there. Uh, so, you know, he was a very nice man at the time. I think that it was very tragic what happened with him and Nicole and Ron Goldman. We used to go to the restaurant there and he actually served us. And he, uh, I don't have any hatred to him, but I, I think he murdered his wife and he got away with it. And then they, he got, they, I guess the police got even with him in the, uh, th that thing in Las Vegas. Well, I was in high school when it happened and, uh, you know, I thought it was crazy, but hey, he was acquitted. You know, Jerry spoke and he was acquitted. Yeah, immediately I was thinking, I, I didn't remember the, that it happened here. And then when I did, I realized I'd been walking by the exact location where they had their last restaurant um, dinner and it was right down there on where the uh, Alfred's Coffee is. There was a lot of fishy stuff that went on with the case and all that stuff that I wasn't happy about. But at the same time, he was a good person. You know, um, I believe he was a good person. He definitely was a good football player. He got away with murder. So although I don't like to see the death of another human being, I'm not shedding any tears. And it's I feel for the Goldman family, for all those who, who got were impacted by his crime. No. I remember him as a great person to begin with. He had a lot of drama in his life, and it was unfortunately very, very publicized and not much of it to, to his favor. Um, it's just sad that he ended the way he did. Well, just, it's just like, oh, you know, I hadn't heard it, but I, I don't feel real sad. <laughs> that seems kind of bad, I mean. A federal judge ruled on Thursday that New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez and his wife Nadine will be tried separately. The Democratic Senator's trial will start on May 6th, as scheduled, along with co-defendants Wael Hanna and Fred Davies. They're all facing charges related to a years-long bribery scheme involving the governments of Egypt and Qatar. Nadine Menendez's trial was postponed to July due to what her lawyers called a serious medical condition. The senator pleaded not guilty last month to a dozen new felony charges. Nadine Menendez, Hanna, and Davies also pleaded not guilty to the newest charges last month. Nadine Menendez's tentative July 8th trial date could change again depending on her health. Wisconsin's Elections Commission rejected a petition yesterday to force a recall election targeting the state's top elected Republican. The GOP official has drawn the ire of former President Donald Trump. Trump backers angry with SM. Well, Robin Voss. So Trump backers are angry with Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, who launched the recall effort. They cited his refusal to decertify President Joe Biden's narrow win in the state in 2020. Voss further angered Trump supporters when he did not back a plan to impeach Megan Wolf, the state's top elections official. Staff at the Wisconsin Elections Commission recommended on Wednesday that the petition be rejected. They said organizers had not gathered enough valid signatures. The commission voted 5-0 the following day to reject the recall effort. And South Dakota's governor is now banned from some parts of her home state. This after tribes voted to legally bar Governor Kristi Noem from visiting reservation land. It's a reaction following comments she made linking tribal leaders to drug cartels. A total of three tribes have initiated the bans this year with the latest action from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe announced on Wednesday. In all, Nome now is legally barred from entering about 10% of land in the state she governs. In recent community forums, she argued that those tribal leaders were more focused on profiting from those cartels than parenting their children on Native American reservations. A number of tribes demanded that Nome apologize. She has not, but she has issued a statement urging tribes to banish the cartels from tribal lands. And U.S. lawmakers representing Maryland have introduced a measure that would have the federal government cover all repair bills from the Maryland Bridge disaster. 
Maryland's two U.S. senators and eight U.S. representatives met with Biden administration officials in Washington this week, joined by Maryland's governor. Maryland has already received $60 million in federal relief funds. A shipping vessel hit the bridge last month when it lost power. Six construction workers were killed and three other people are still missing. President Biden visited the disaster site last week. He said he expects the bridge to reopen by the end of May. Senator Ben Cardin said in these situations, the federal government would typically cover 90 percent of the cost rather than the 100 percent he's aiming for. The estimated cost to rebuild the bridge runs in the billions of dollars. Controversy at another Planet Fitness gym, this time in North Carolina. A 38-year-old man who said he identified as a woman went into the woman's locker room, according to police and 911 callers. He proceeded to remove all his clothes. A local channel reported that the man asked a 17-year-old girl to use lotion and shower together. Police arrested the man for indecent exposure. Planet Fitness lets members use locker rooms and bathrooms based on how they say they identify. Planet Fitness says they're against any kind of harassment. Recently, there was a controversy when a woman's membership got canceled. This after she told employees about a man who identifies as a woman shaving in the women's locker room and talked about it online. And a federal appeals court in St. Louis heard arguments yesterday on reinstating Arkansas's ban on cross-sex procedures for minors. Last year, a judge deemed the state's ban unconstitutional. The 2021 law would stop doctors from providing cross-sex procedures or puberty blockers to anyone under 18. The American Civil Liberties Union, representing four minors who identify as another gender, challenged the law. Their attorney says the ban infringes on the parents' rights to make decisions concerning their children's medical care. The hearing drew attention from various quarters, including actor Elliot Page. Laws banning cross-sex procedures for minors have been enacted in at least 24 states. And lawmakers in Tennessee are con contemplating making it a crime for adults to assist minors in accessing cross-sex procedures without parental consent. The state Senate passed the bill on Thursday. Now it heads to the House. The bill has similar language to an anti-abortion trafficking measure the Tennessee Se state recently, the Tennessee Senate recently passed. That bill aims to stop adults from helping young people get abortions without parental consent. Both bills have wide-ranging applications. Critics note violations could include discussing with a minor where to get cross-sex procedures. A free speech organization recently released a report titled No Graduation Without Indoctrination, the DEI Course Mandate. It said it documented for the first time that a vast majority of colleges require DEI courses in order to graduate. To learn more, I spoke with Sharice Trump, Executive Director of Speech First. Sharice, welcome and thank you for joining us. Now, tell us about your organization's recent findings on DEI graduation requirements. Yeah, absolutely. So we actually had been told by a number of our students that they were being required to take DEI courses in order to graduate. And at first we had just assumed this was an online training module, but then we soon realized it's actually a full semester long course. So we started to do some digging. We looked at over around 248 private and public universities and colleges, found that 67% of those campuses actually mandate in some way a DEI themed course in order for students to satisfy their gen ed requirements. And we found that also 59% of those campuses uh, are are actually public taxpayer funded universities. So people can generally agree that there's great value in learning about different cultures and beliefs, but what are students actually learning in these mandatory DEI college courses? Yeah, I think it's important to note that while you know students should be able to opt in to taking a DEI course or learning about diversity in other cultures, the idea of mandating them uh, is something that we should be very hesitant about, especially when the courses that satisfy this requirement are not as simple as multiculturalism. They are actually much more insidious. Most of them are focused on racism, the science behind racism, uh, queer theory, queer ideology. A lot of them stem in what's known as critical race theory or critical gender theory. They 
pull students apart through Marxist ideology of looking at the world through the lens of only the oppressor versus the oppressed. Uh, most of these courses, you can even look at some of the examples we have in the report, you see things from Queering Childhood, which basically talks about the destruction of the family, uh, you, uh, you know, how actually encouraging students to destroy the family. And you actually look at, school, uh, at courses that are having to do with social justice advocacy, where they, in order to satisfy all the requirements for that course, you have to actually participate in a protest in one of the social justice uh, versions uh, of the ideology. When did DEI mandates start gaining traction on U.S. college campuses? Yeah, this has been going on for some time now, and I think you know millions of dollars have been pouring in, especially in the last uh, five to ten years. You've been seeing the DEI bureaucracies and administrations on campus grow exponentially, especially even more recently in the last few years as popularity has kicked up. It's important to note that this popularity is very one-sided. It's specifically designed to force students into a political mindset, to push a political agenda that um, they might not necessarily agree with. Um, uh, the goal here ultimately is to push a political ideology. It is not to actually educate the students. It is not to open their minds. And Sharice, very briefly, what or who is driving this push? And is it coming from within the U.S. or internationally? Uh, probably a combination of factors. Uh, you, you see a lot of uh, private funding behind this. We won't really know until investigations are started again by the Department of Education to see what kind of foreign funding is being um, attributed to a lot of this. I know the Trump administration had previously done some investigating uh, and found that Qatar and China have um, significant uh, impact financially on the direction of many universities, but we never really got to see the full version of that report or to see it all the way through uh, because the you know because when the Biden administration took over they basically just stopped doing that research stopped doing that investigation very lastly what do you believe can and should be done about it Ultimately, the states need to take charge here. There's a number of states that we talk about in the report who have initiated or passed legislation that shuts down the EI departments on campus. The states that have gone the furthest are Florida and Texas, from what we know. Uh, but even then, you see a number of universities that are going to attempt to circumvent these laws. They're going to try to find ways around them. They'll repurpose the DEI administrators instead of firing them. They'll continue to incorporate DEI concepts into the curriculum unless you see full account on abilities. All right, Sharice, it's been wonderful listening and it's a pleasure. Um, thank you so much for informing us and the viewers. Absolutely. Thank you. The Senate Judiciary Committee subpoenaed legal advocate Leonard Leo yesterday as part of an ethics probe into Supreme Court justices. The probe was started last year over alleged undisclosed travel and gifts to Justices Clarence Thomas and Samuel Alito. Senate Judiciary Chair Dick Durbin accuses Leo of playing a central role in what he called an ethics crisis that he says is plaguing the Supreme Court. Durbin says Leo has repeatedly stonewalled the committee. The committee says the subpoena is needed to better understand if undisclosed gifts were used to gain access to justices. Leo's attorney reacted in a letter to Durbin saying he will not comply. Leo, who served as an advisor to former President Trump called the subpoena unlawful and politically motivated. Democrats would need Republican support to gain the 60 votes needed to enforce the subpoena if Leo defies it. Coming up, Israel says it's on high alert for a possible attack by Iran and why the U.S. issued an immediate order to all government employees in Israel. And Russian military instructors reportedly active in the African country of Niger this week. This comes as African nations are increasingly turning away from the West. Details after the break. I have never seen a production any better than this anywhere. Breathtaking. It is absolutely stunning. I feel better about the world. I feel uplifted invigorating, it was encouraging, gave me hope. This has just been therapy for the soul. It's a must see, must see. Make sure you see it, make sure you see it. Coming to Lincoln Center, NJ Pack, State Theater, Purchase, and Stamford, genuine.com.
Water, nature's ultimate cleaner. We drink it, we bathe in it. Think water, think steam, think clean. Now harness the power of water with the H2O X5 5-in-1 steam cleaning system. I'm so impressed with the X5. It's an all-in-one product. I can use it throughout my entire house. It's cleaning, it's sanitizing. There's no chemicals in it. It's just steam. This is unbelievable. There is no more odor. You could spend over $500 to purchase the products that the X5 5-in-1 Miracle replaces. Order your H2O X5 steam cleaning system, a $500 value, for just four easy payments of $43. Order now and we'll upgrade your X5 package. We'll add a sixth mode with a dusting and polishing wand. Valued at over $30, this extra bonus attachment makes your H2O X5 the H2O X6. That means your 10-piece system becomes a 12-piece system at no extra cost to you. All for just three easy payments of $43. Call or click right now. Hillsdale College is reaching and teaching millions of Americans to pursue truth and defend liberty. But to do that in an even bigger way, we need your help. Your generous support helps educate students from kindergarten to college, all while refusing every penny of government funding, even indirect funding like student loans or grants. And your dedicated giving allows us to teach millions of Americans through our free online courses. You make all the difference. Give a gift today. Just use this link. All right, I'm at the house and uh, I'm gonna head inside. Okay, come on, this door. I'm in the house. What do you see? Uh, let me check the den. Uh, there's nothing in the den. Let me check the kitchen. Uh, there's no one downstairs, it looks like. Wait, what was that? I don't know. Let me, let me head upstairs. What do you see? What the? Did you shut this bathroom door? No. What? It's not here. What do you mean? The, the gun's not here. What? Where is it? Oh my god. What's going hey, on? Cam! Oh my god, what's going Cameron? on? Cameron? Are you in there? Open the door! Cam! Please! Please! Open the door, Cameron! Come on, Cam. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Israel's military says they are preparing for a possible attack from Iran. After a senior Iranian general and other military leaders were reportedly killed in an airstrike in Syria earlier this month, tensions in the region have been high. Here's more. Israel's military has not claimed responsibility for the deadly strike, but said it is highly prepared for a range of scenarios if Iran retaliates. An attack from Iran's territory will be solid proof of Iran's intention to escalate in the Middle East and stop hiding behind its proxies. IDF spokesman Daniel Hagari said Israel has been attacked by Iranian proxies from nearby countries for weeks, most prominently by the Houthis of Yemen and Hezbollah in Lebanon. He said while Israel's defense systems intercept most of these threats, the country is still on high alert. Israel's defense minister Yoav Gallant said that an Iranian attack on Israel would warrant an appropriate response. In a meeting with Gallant, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin assured Israel they could count on full U.S. support to defend against Iranian attacks. Meanwhile, the U.S. said Thursday it had restricted its employees in Israel and their families from personal travel outside big cities. The U.S. Embassy released a security alert citing an abundance of caution, saying government personnel are authorized to travel only between Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Be'er Sheva. In an effort to avoid escalation in the region, Secretary of State Antony Blinken on Thursday met with Turkish, Chinese, and Saudi Arabian foreign ministers. The White House, meanwhile, said they were in communication with Iran. We communicated to Iran that the U.S. had no involvement uh, in the strike, as I just mentioned, uh, that happened in Damascus, and we warned Iran not to use uh, this attack as a pretext uh, to escalate further in the region or attack U.S. facilities or pers personnel. At the same time, the White House affirmed the U.S.'s ironclad commitment to Israel's security. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made strong comments about Iranian and other possible threats. He spoke to Israeli troops at an Air Force base on Thursday. And we established a simple principle. Whoever hurts us, we hurt him. 
On Thursday, the military said Israeli jets hit Hezbollah military targets in the areas of Lebanon. Netanyahu's statements come as Israel pulls its troops out of the Gaza Strip in preparation for an assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah. And a group of around 10 students from UC Berkeley protesting the war in Gaza disrupted a graduating dinner at the home of the school's dean this week. Video from a confrontation Tuesday is making its rounds on social media. The dean and his wife asked the student to leave multiple times and threatened to call the police after she took out a speaker and microphone. The student says the First Amendment protects her conduct. She's now accusing the professor's wife of assaulting her for contact she made when trying to grab the microphone. The school's dean, Erwin Shemarinsky, says he's deeply saddened students would use a social occasion at his home for a political agenda. He says the protesters tried to have other students boycott the dinner with posters on campus and social media posts. The dean said the posters depicted him as a cartoon figure holding a bloody knife and fork. He said the caption read, No dinner with Zionist Shem while Gaza starves. He said the posters should be left up because of freedom of speech, even though many students and staff told him they made them feel unsafe. He's professor, here's Professor Sherminsky on the incident. We invited the graduating students over at the request of the class presidents to celebrate their graduation. And when a student took out of her backpack a microphone and an amplifier and began talking about what's going on in the Middle East, that's not okay in my home. No one was speaking that night. It wasn't in any way an occasion for anything but socializing and celebration. The university's chancellor reacted in a statement that she was appalled and deeply disturbed by what happened. She said, while the school's support free speech is unwavering, it can't condone, con it can't condone using a social occasion at a private residence as a platform for protest. She wrote, there is not a First Amendment right to use private property for speech. And uh, shifting gears, we have some short headlines from Russia, Italy, and other European countries up next. Russia is reportedly sending military instructors to the African country of Niger. That's according to Niger State Television RTN. The channel reports that the instructors landed in Africa on Wednesday in a plane loaded with military equipment. This is part of an agreement between Niger and Russia to boost cooperation. Since the 2023 coup, Niger's military has kicked out French and European forces. It's turning away from the West and instead strengthened its military ties with Russia. Historic floods in Russia and Kazakhstan continue impacting the lives of thousands of people. Today, authorities in the Russian city of Orenburg called for the mass evacuation of residents. Floodwaters keep rising as major rivers burst their banks, but that's mostly due to huge masses of melting snow. Almost 100,000 people had to evacuate in Kazakhstan. Authorities have declared a state of emergency in 10 out of 17 regions in the country. The level of the Ural River in Orenburg has reached around 37 feet. The deputy mayor says the flood should reach its peak today and start subsiding in two days' time. Suspected Russian interference in Europe's elections in June. The Belgian intelligence Ser service has confirmed the existence of a network trying to undermine support for Ukraine. The country's prime minister announced an investigation into Russia's alleged plans. Pro-Russian agents have allegedly been seeking to influence and even pay European lawmakers. That's so they promote a pro-Russian agenda. Europe-wide polls are being held in early June to elect a new EU parliament. Italian labor unions went on strike on Thursday. They're demanding more safety measures at the workplace. This comes after a deadly explosion at a hydro plant that killed at least five people. Enough now. Not only deaths at work, enough now. We can't stand this anymore. The killings are increasing and getting closer and closer to each other. The largest demonstration was held in Bologna. More protests took place in Turin, Naples and Perugia. Tuesday's explosion shook the plant more than 100 feet below the water level. This caused flooding and the collapse of part of the nine-story underground structure. Coming up, the U.S. aviation industry is uniting against China, seeking to block new flights between the two nations. Find out why. And China reportedly trying to phase out foreign microchips potentially impacting major U.S. chipmakers like Intel and AMD. More shortly, here on NTD News Today. If you 
you're watching this, I didn't make it. Thanks to people like you and the American Heart Association, my family never had to see this video. I was a healthy 47-year-old, no symptoms. But then my doctor discovered I had a bad heart valve that was beyond repair. The scariest day of my life was when I was sitting on a gurney as I looked at my wife was at my side and my kids had me surrounded. Deep down, you know, this could be it. This could be all there is. Not having him around for Riley to grow up with and have that papa figure in his life, that would have been hard. This little heart valve did something really big. It saved my life. I wouldn't be here today without it. The research for this heart valve was funded by the American Heart Association. And that's why I'm asking you to become a monthly donor for just $19 a month. When you do, you'll help fund the next medical breakthrough that could save your life or the life of someone you love. You'll also provide life-saving CPR training and help certify hospitals to give the best care to those who have had a heart attack or stroke. When you give $19 a month, we'll send you a t-shirt just like this one. From the moment you put it on, you'll help raise awareness for heart disease and stroke. Since my surgery, I had a son get married. I had a daughter graduate high school. I had another daughter give birth to a precious boy. I would have missed all that. And that's why it's personal for me. We're very thankful for everyone who is a donor because it gives us more time. Every 40 seconds, someone has a heart attack. The next person you help save could be someone you love or even you. Become a monthly donor today by calling or going to helpheart.org because it's personal. My dad's name was David. He always talked about getting life insurance, and now it's too late. No one was expecting my husband Dave to suffer from a heart attack. We didn't have life insurance. We thought we had more time. Don't be Dave, and don't wait until it's too late to get the life insurance coverage you need. And if you don't have enough insurance to cover funeral costs, credit card debt, and other expenses, your family is going to get stuck with the bill. Call now to get affordable life insurance. Just call. 800-494-1562. If you're over 50, you can't be turned down for this insurance regardless of your health. Plus, there's no medical exam, no health questions. Your rate will never go up. Your coverage will never go down and rates start as low as $5 a week. Remember, don't be Dave. Call now. Call now. 800-494-1562. Want to know what's really happening around the world? Join us for a deep dive discussion with our expert panel on International Reporters Roundtable. Pressure is growing on the Biden administration to block additional flights to and from China. Two lawmakers, plus Delta, United, and American Airlines, wrote letters to the U.S. Secretaries of State and Transportation. They asked the administration to be cautious about approving more flights between the two countries because of what China's unfair market practice, they called it. The lawmakers are Representatives Mike Gallagher and Raja Krishnamurthy the chair and ranking member of the House Select China Committee. They said China effectively closed its aviation market to U.S. carriers during COVID. U.S. carriers have limited access to the Chinese aviation market. Plus, there are challenging rules that affect operations. The airline said the U.S. government needs to establish a policy to protect the aviation industry. Joining us now is NTD Business Matters host, Don Ma, to give us the latest updates from the tech and business world. Don, good to see you. Good to see you. Yeah, welcome, Don. So what do you have for us today? Yeah, so we're going to stay on China uh, following your update on airlines. So what we have is apparently Chinese officials directing the country's largest telecom carriers earlier this year to phase out foreign chips and they want to do this by 2027. So specifically, these are chips that are key to China's networks. Uh, this is according to the Wall Street Journal, by the way, today, citing people familiar with the development. Now, the move would impact U.S. chip giants, Intel and Advanced Micro Devices or AMD. 
Uh, and this is also according to the report. Uh, so Beijing has uh, ramped up efforts to replace Western-made technology with domestic alternatives alongside China-U.S. trade tensions. And this is amid Washington tightening curbs on high-tech exports to China as well. Uh, now, apparently state-owned enterprises were actually instructed uh, in 2022 to replace office software systems with domestic products uh, by 2027. This is actually uh, the first time uh, such specific you know, uh, deadlines were actually imposed. The Wall Street Journal says that uh, China's Ministry of uh, Industry and Information Technology ordered state-owned mobile operators to inspect their networks for non-Chinese semiconductors and map out timelines to replace them. So this is according to Chinese officials. And the Financial Times had reported earlier in March that Beijing uh, had introduced guidelines to phase out U.S. chips from Intel and AMD from government personal computers and services. Uh, so that's from the Financial Times as well earlier this year. Uh, so China was Intel's largest market uh, for your information last year and was responsible for more than 27 percent uh, of Intel's total revenue. So uh, not not too much, but you know it's still uh, significant here. 27 percent is is not not small. Uh, so procurements by Chinese telecom carriers show that they are increasingly switching to domestic options, and this has been made possible in part by the improved quality and stability of local chips. Uh, this is all according to the report. Oh, fascinating. I do hope we get some more updates on this, and we'll be relying on you for that, Don. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it, Don. Thanks. And next up, staying with China news, Chinese influence campaigns active on U.S. soil, going as far as telling U.S. officials what to do when it comes to Taiwan. A new case just came to light. New York City Mayor Eric Adams skipped a banquet with Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen last year. While it's unclear why Adams skipped the banquet, Chinese Consul General Huang Ping sent him a letter urging him to, quote, avoid any kind of official contact with Tsai when she's in New York City. Here's more. The Chinese Communist Party claims Taiwan uh, as part of its own territory. Jimmy Quinn is the national security correspondent of National Review. He broke the story on the letter. It believes that it has the right to forcefully annex Taiwan using force, which, which of course, uh, the Taiwanese don't want. Um, and it, it really doesn't respect American sovereignty uh, and U.S. officials' right to meet with uh, Taiwanese officials. It is unclear why Adams didn't go to the event, but New Jersey's governor and other lawmakers from the state, plus New York State Senator Iwen Chu, did attend the banquet. NTD reached out to the mayor's office for comment, but did not hear back before airtime. The Chinese embassy also sent emails to several top congressmen that were scheduled to meet with Tsai in California. That's including then House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, plus Congress members like Gallagher and Raja Krishnamurti, the chair and ranking member of the House Select China Committee, respectively. Threatening them, saying that China would not sit idly by if they were to go and meet President Tsai Ing-wen. Um, they went ahead and they did it anyway. They did it gleefully. It, it just goes to show that members of Congress aren't messing around when uh, they're faced with efforts by the Chinese Communist Party to bully them. Though Quinn points to a broader and more concerning trend. Where the party, which has faced uh, headwinds against influencing members of Congress uh, and federal officials, is now turning to state and local officials to exert its influence. In 2021, the Chinese embassy tried to invite a top education official in Utah to attend a propaganda webinar focused on painting Beijing's version of its atrocities against a Uyghur ethnic group. The official did not attend the event. This is an all-encompassing effort that is basically going after anyone with any level of influence in the United States, whether or not they have a direct bearing on U.S. foreign policy and national security. Warnings and threats aside, Chinese influence operations also take the form of honey traps and friendly trips. China invited California Governor Gavin Newsom on a trip there last year. 
Another example is an alleged Chinese spy named Christine Fung. She tried to get close to Congressman Eric Swalwell and fundraised for his campaign. That was back before he entered Congress and was still a city council member in California. Swalwell is not accused of wrongdoing. He cut ties with Fung after being briefed by U.S. intelligence officials. A U.S. intelligence agency previously warned state and local officials that they are being targeted by China. It said Beijing understands state and local leaders enjoy a degree of independence from Washington and because of that may seek to use them to advocate for Beijing's interests in U.S. policy. A Chinese university in downtown San Francisco. That's one of the aims of San Francisco Mayor London Breed, who is heading to China for a week. She says she wants to help San Francisco's economy and tourism recover from the pandemic. Reed is also advocating for more direct flights from China and to have pandas sent to the San Francisco Zoo. The trip aims to boost tourism from the communist nation, which dropped during the pandemic. Reed hopes it will also improve her relationship with Chinese-American voters who have expressed dissatisfaction with her performance. She plans to meet with Chinese businesses and Fudan University to discuss a campus in San Francisco. The trip, funded by private donations, includes around 30 San Francisco leaders. We turn our attention now to Canada. A former employee of a top utilities company appeared in court recently after getting charged with spying for China. 37-year-old Yue Sheng Wang last week pleaded not guilty to two new espionage charges in a courtroom in Quebec. Back in 2022, Canadian authorities arrested and charged Wang with four counts of economic espionage. Prosecutors said he obtained trade secrets to benefit communist China while he worked for Hydro Quebec. Earlier this year, Canadian authorities filed two new charges against Wong. He is the first person in Canada charged with economic espionage under Canada's Security of Information Act. Wong is a Chinese national in Canada on a work visa. Canadian police said he gave information about Hydro-Quebec to a Chinese university and Chinese research centers. They also said he applied to the Chinese regime's talent recruitment program and promised technology transfer to the regime. While in court, Wong argued the information he sent was not secret and was open source. Canadian police, or RCMP, said this about the case. Quote, the RCMP has a mandate to detect and disrupt foreign interference attempts. It investigates activities by or for foreign actors that pose a risk to Canadian institutions and the economy. Wong has been on bail since November 2022. His trial will continue in early May. Reporting by Allison Lee, NTD News. Before we head to break, if you have any feedback, please email us at news.today at ntd.com. But stay with us. We'll have more stories in just a moment. There are real consequences to controlled media. And NTD's founders know them firsthand. Our freedom of thought is the price. This is the lesson that guides us in everything we do. Yeah, so there's the tear gas there. We know the value of a free society. And we take seriously the responsibility to preserve it. We are NTD. What's happened to this world we're living in? Why? For the four years he has been on this earth, he has known nothing but war. Wherever I go, the things I see, I just want to turn away. The dreams I have, the stories I could tell, will they still be possible? 
This year, more than ever, I need a brand new world. A clean world. Where I can improve myself and be inspired. My stage can be anywhere and everywhere. But it begins here. Changing World, a brighter way of life. There's a whirlwind of emotion and activity going on in this painting. And there's chaos all around and threat from below. The wolves surrounding her and they're anything but unmoved. They're moving all the time, and we sense that. But this little girl remains unmoved. She's in quite a perilous situation, but she's completely strong and serene, and she's actually meditating. It was very, very well liked because no matter what culture or what sort of walk of life you're from, I think people, they see it and they immediately understand what that energy, what that message is, and they, they're they drawn to it because everybody kind of needs a little bit of that in their own life, of, you know, the steadfast calmness and something to hold on to. It's definitely an inner peace in the midst of something very chaotic, and for a lot of people right now, the whole world is very, very chaotic, so I guess that's another reason why so many people are very drawn to this. What was the process of actually putting this all together? Many, many hours of finding the right camera angles and watching it. The first trouble started just after one o'clock. 45 pages, here it is right here. Donald Trump has been indicted. Somber day for the country. This all happened before President Trump's speech was over. The founder of the Oath Keepers Militia Group is headed to prison for more than 18 years. His lawyers didn't have this no. video. The, the video we're watching right now his own lawyers did not no. have. There was a big question of what did the people do who actually did enter the building. This is where we picked it up with the security footage that is new. At this point, the, the story dramatically changes. The New Jersey man who assaulted a Capitol police officer on January 6th has been sentenced. So this was withheld. This was not shown to the defense. That could be considered exculpatory evidence. This doesn't seem like what a lot of the media is showing. It's going to change narratives no matter what your political perspective is. What we're after is the truth.
The House advances a modified version of a bill to reauthorize a powerful spy program. It's the second attempt after a failed vote earlier this week. Our Washington correspondent Louise Martinez has more from Capitol Hill. Jury selection begins April 15th in former President Donald Trump's New York criminal trial. A legal expert explains the process. Football great O.J. Simpson, acquitted of murdering his wife and friend in 1995, dead at 76. We hear people's reactions to his passing. Suspected Russian interference in upcoming European elections, Belgium is opening an investigation into an alleged meddling scheme. Messages between a Fauci advisor and a zoologist who funneled money to the Wuhan lab. Newly disclosed emails reveal their communications. In NFL news, will Tom Brady make a comeback? The seven-time Super Bowl champion stirred the pot with his latest retirement comments. And today's Dave Martin joins us to discuss. A spelling contest in front of the Eiffel Tower. French people share their experience and their love for words. This is NTD News Today, live from our NTD Global Headquarters. Here are Stephania Cox and Chris Beers. Hi, I'm David Lamb. I'm sitting in for Chris Beers. And to begin the show, House Speaker Mike Johnson and former President Trump are expected to deliver remarks on election integrity at Mar-a-Lago this afternoon. The meeting comes after disagreements between Johnson and Trump on issues such as aid to Ukraine and the reauthorization of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. The meeting will reportedly involve a major announcement on election integrity and legislation to ban non-citizen voting. Federal law currently bans non-citizens from voting in federal elections. The event comes amid a looming threat from Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene to force a vote to unseat Johnson as House Speaker. Greene has criticized Johnson for negotiating with Democrats on the recent spending bills. Despite the tension, it's expected that Trump will support Johnson, who defended him during the impeachment trials. And jury selection is set to start April 15th in former President Donald Trump's New York criminal trial. That is Monday. Trump is accused of writing off hush money payments as legal fees to keep claims of extramarital affairs from becoming public during his 2016 campaign. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest. A Manhattan jury will be the first in history to hear a criminal case against a former and potentially future American president. The presumptive Republican nominee for November has pleaded not guilty. Trump denies wrongdoing and contends that the case is an effort to sabotage his run for a second term. They don't have to find people who've never heard of the case. They have to find people who, despite having heard of the case, say they can be fair and impartial. Attorneys can challenge prospective jurors over specific reasons they say the jurors can't serve or can't be unbiased. The judge rules on those challenges. If the judge finds that the juror cannot hear the case fairly and cannot be an impartial jury, then that person will be excused by the judge and that there are unlimited numbers of excusals for cause that can be used. Under New York law, both the prosecution and the defense can strike 10 prospective jurors and two alternates without giving a reason. You know, one thing you have to be worried about in this type of trial is people wanting to get on who can't be fair and impartial, but who want to uh, monetize their participation in the jury system by writing a book or something after about the experience. The trial is expected to last six weeks. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. We have more updates on Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis, who brought the Georgia RICO case against former President Trump. The Justice Department said earlier this week they asked Willis to resolve inconsistencies in how her office reports federal funding. Earlier this year, a former Fulton County employee revealed that some federal funding sent to Willis's office was used for different expenses. The Justice Department confirmed it had discovered inconsistencies in how Willis's office reported that grant money. The agency is now working to receive the correct reports. House Republicans are currently probing this case. House Judiciary Chair Chairman Jim Jordan said that a former Fulton County employee has been speaking with his staff about the alleged funding problems. 
O.J. Simpson, the NFL star and actor who was acquitted in a sensational 1995 trial over the murder of his former wife and her friend, has died at the age of 76. We have reactions to his passing. I went to USC when he was there. Uh, so, you know, he was a very nice man at the time. I think that it was very tragic what happened with him and Nicole and Ron Goldman. We used to go to the restaurant there and he actually served us. And he, uh, I don't have any hatred to him, but I, I think he murdered his wife and he got away with it. And then they, he got, they, I guess the police got even with him in the, uh, th that thing in Las Vegas. Well, I was in high school when it happened and, uh, you know, I thought it was crazy, but hey, he was acquitted. You know, Jerry spoke and he was acquitted. Yeah, immediately I was thinking, I, I didn't remember the, that it happened here. And then when I did, I realized I'd been walking by the exact location where they had their last restaurant um, dinner. And it was right down there on where the uh, Alfred's Coffee is. There was a lot of fishy stuff that went on with the case and all that stuff that I wasn't happy about. But at the same time, he was a good person, you know. Um, I believe he was a good person. He definitely was a good football player. He got away with murder, so although I don't like to see the death of another human being, I'm not shedding any tears. And it's I feel for the Goldman family, for all those who, who got were impacted by his crime. No. I remember him as a great person to begin with. He had a lot of drama in his life and it was unfortunately very, very publicized and not much of it to, to his favor. Um, it's just sad that he ended the way he did. Well, just, it's just like, oh, you know, I hadn't heard it, but um, I don't feel real sad. <laughs> that seems kind of bad, I mean. The Biden administration said today it's forgiving another round of student loan debt to the tune of $7.4 billion. The move will impact some 277,000 borrowers. It's part of a program enacted by the White House to make it easier for some specific groups of borrowers, like public sector workers, to qualify for loan forgiveness. The program also includes a repayment plan that creates a shorter pathway to loan forgiveness for many low-income borrowers. Republicans have sharply criticized the program. They argue the president is transferring the cost of student loan debt to taxpayers who chose not to go to college or who have already paid for it themselves. In total, the Biden administration has authorized the cancellation of around $150 billion in student loan debt for over 4 million people. That's more than 9% of all outstanding federal student loan debt. And U.S. lawmakers representing Maryland have introduced a measure that would have the federal government cover all repair bills from the Maryland Bridge disaster. Maryland's two U.S. senators and eight U.S. representatives met with Biden administration officials in Washington this week, joined by Maryland's governor. Maryland has already received $60 million in federal relief funds. A shipping vessel hit the bridge last month when it lost power. Six construction workers were killed and three other people are still missing. President Biden visited the disaster site last week. He said he expects the bridge to reopen by the end of May. Senator Ben Cardin said in these situations, the federal government would typically cover 90% of the cost rather than the 100% he's aiming for. The estimated cost to rebuild the bridge runs in the billions of dollars. Coming up, the Biden administration said it will forgive over $7 billion more in student loan debt for over 200,000 borrowers. Details on the latest round of attempted loan cancellations. Tennessee advances a bill that would ban first cousin marriages, but not without pushback from a lawmaker. He told a story about a first cousin marriage in his own family. And Denver continues cutting city services to support illegal immigrants. We have the details of the new plan and where the money will come from in just a moment here on NTD News Today. Is deep sea fish oil really healthy? Due to pollution in the oceans, most fish contain heavy metal elements and radioactive substances. That's why it's so important to choose a pure source of omega-3. Puritan green vegetable omega-3 is made from purslan and perillacine, which are rich in nutrients and minerals, especially vitamins A, D, E, calcium, and iron. With natural processing and no harmful chemical additives, it has more than 90% concentration of omegas 3, 6, 7, and 9. 
It effectively improves brain power and is beneficial to the heart's health. Puritang Omega-3 does not smell of fish and contains no pollutants, so both adults and children can safely and easily consume it over a long period of time. Puritang Green Vegetable Omega-3. Greener, healthier, and more effective. Visit puritang.com to learn more. I was born into the wrong body. Well, I was astounded by what they were teaching. Child Protective Services did show up at my house. Parents are fearful of losing custody of their children because they say the wrong thing. Risks? No, no risks. Uh, we got everything covered, I assure you, Mrs. Connors. They don't want anyone to know the truth. I can't stay quiet about this anymore. It's destroyed my health. We're pushed into silence. When I started my pillow, it was just a problem solution, one product company. Well, since then, with the help of my dedicated employees, we now have hundreds of products, some you might not even know about. To get the word out, we're having a $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use my pillows, $25. My pillow sandals, $25. And for the first time ever, our six pack towel sets. You guessed it, just $25. Our brand new four pack dish towels, $25. And I've never done this before. Premium my pillows with all new Giza fabric, any size, any loft level, even king size for only $25. And there's so much more. So go to mypillow.com or call the number on your screen. Use your promo code for our $25 extravaganza. Order $75 and over, your entire order ships absolutely free. I love you. We're in the nation's capital asking the important questions so that you're in the know. Join us daily, Monday through Friday, on the Capitol Report on NTD News. Wisconsin's Elections Commission rejected a petition yesterday to force a recall election targeting the state's top elected Republican. The GOP official has drawn the ire of former President Donald Trump. Trump backers, angry with Assembly Speaker Robin Voss, launched the recall effort. They cited his refusal to decertify President Joe Biden's narrow win in the state in 2020. Voss further angered Trump supporters when he did not back a plan to impeach Megan Wolf, the state's top elections official. Staff at the Wisconsin's, Wisconsin Elections Commission recommended on Wednesday that the petition be rejected. They said organizers had not gathered enough valid signatures. The commission voted 5-0 the following day to reject the recall effort. Senate Republicans now demanding an impeachment trial against Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. This as Republicans fear Senate Democrats are not planning to hold the trial. House Republicans voted to impeach Mayorkas in February over his handling of the southern border. 43 Republican senators sent a letter yesterday to Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. They say the Senate has almost always held trials when the House sent articles of impeachment. The letter states since 1797, 21 individuals have been impeached by the House of Representatives. Trials were held in every single instance except once. They added that illegal immigration has increased by over 400 percent in just three years. Six Republicans did not sign the letter. Some question whether the House has shown enough evidence for impeachment. Homeland Security has denied accusations of wrongdoing by Mayorkas. A spokesperson previously said that the impeachment was conducted without any evidence against the secretary. Denver continues cutting city services to aid illegal immigrants. Mayor Mike Johnston now says the city is allocating $90 million to care for the arriving immigrants. Out of the $90 million, the majority will go to housing, around $50 million. Other costs include supportive services and transportation. 
The funds will come from cuts to services and supplies, capital funds, and more. The largest reduction is from not filling 160 job vacancies, which is scheduled to bring in almost $20 million. The mayor on Wednesday said this plan proves the city can be compassionate while still being fiscally responsible. South Dakota's governor is now banned from some parts of her home state. This after tribes voted to legally bar Governor Kristi Noem from visiting reservation land. It's their reaction following comments she made linking tribal leaders to drug cartels. A total of three tribes have initiated the bans this year, with the latest action from the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe announced on Wednesday. In all, Noem is now legally barred from entering about 10% of lands in the state she governs. In recent community forums, she argued that those tri tribal leaders were more focused on profiting from those cartels than parenting their children on Native American reservations. A number of tribes demanded that Noam apologize. She has not, but she has issued a statement urging tribes to banish their cartels from tribal lands. The Tennessee State Legislature voted in favor of a bill that bans marriage between first cousins, but one lawmaker argued for an exception to the ban. The State House voted overwhelmingly in favor of the bill, which was already approved in the State Senate. One opponent of the bill was State Representative Gino Bolso. He previously shared a personal story with lawmakers. He said his grandparents came from Italy as first cousins, and they traveled to Tennessee so they could get married. This time, he argued for an exception to the rule during debate time. He said that an, an amendment should be attached to the bill to allow first cousins to be married if they first seek genetic counseling to understand the risk of birth defects. He also argued against the ban since no birth defect risk exists for same-sex first cousin couples. The lawmaker who proposed the ban argued that it doesn't violate same-sex marriage laws. Lawmakers voted for the bill without Bolso's amendment, and it now goes to the governor for approval. And a federal appeals court in St. Louis heard arguments yesterday on reinstating Arkansas's ban on cross-sex procedures for minors. Last year, a judge deemed the state's ban unconstitutional. The 2021 law would stop doctors from providing cross-sex procedures or puberty blockers to anyone under 18. The American Civil Liberties Union, representing four minors who identify as another gender, challenged the law. Their attorney says the ban infringes on the parents' rights to make decisions concerning their children's medical care. The hearing drew attention from various quarters, including actor Elliot Page. Laws banning cross-sex procedures for minors have been enacted in at least 24 states. Lawmakers in Tennessee are contemplating making it a crime for adults to assist minors in accessing cross-sex procedures without parental consent. The state Senate passed the bill on Thursday. Now it heads to the House. The bill has similar language to an anti-abortion trafficking measure the Tennessee Senate recently passed. That measure aims to stop adults from helping young people get abortions without parental consent. Both bills have wide-ranging applications. Critics note violations could include discussing where to get cross-sex procedures with a minor. Controversy at another Planet Fitness gym, this time in North Carolina. A 38-year-old man who said he identified as a woman went into the women's locker room, according to police and 911 callers. He proceeded to remove all his clothes. A local channel reported that the man asked a 17-year-old girl to use lotion and shower together. Police arrested the man for indecent exposure. Planet Fitness lets members use locker rooms and bathrooms based on how they say they identify. Planet Fitness says they're against any kind of harassment. Recently, there was a controversy when a woman's membership got canceled. This after she told employees about a man who identifies as a woman shaving in the women's locker room and she talked about it online. Oakland has voted in favor of changing the name of the city's airport to San Francisco Bay Oakland International Airport. San Francisco has threatened a lawsuit over what it says is a trademark violation. Travelers unfamiliar with the region sometimes fly into San Francisco's airport even if their destination is closer to the Oakland airport across the bay. The airport's three-letter code, Oak, would not change. The name change suggestion has horrified San Francisco officials. They say it will confuse travelers, especially those flying in from abroad. San Francisco's city attorney threatened to sue Oakland officials if they pursue the name change. Some pointed out on X 
that San Francisco's airport is actually located in Millbrae, a city in San Mateo County. U Uber and Lyft will keep operating in Minneapolis for now. The Minneapolis City Council unanimously voted to implement a new pay plan on July 1st instead of their earlier deadline of May 1st. So this extension is a good faith on our side for the state, for the new apps, or new companies coming in. But the threats of Uber and Lyft holding us hostage is still out there. We will support what the legislators decide to bring and we want that something that is not a burden to the people of Minnesota. We care and we are Minnesotans as well and we have every right to fight for our rights and get livable wages so we can also take care of our families. The delay will give other less established ride hailing companies more time to get started. State lawmakers will also have an opportunity to approve statewide rules. Under the ordinance, ride hailing companies would have to pay drivers a minimum rate of $1.40 per mile, 51 cents per minute, or $5 per ride, whichever is greater. The change is intended to ensure companies pay drivers the equivalent of the city's minimum wage of $15.57 per hour. Uber and Lyft say they will leave Minneapolis if the city ordinance takes effect. And the commissioner of the FDA is advising Congress to pass legislation that would require imported food products to be tested for lead. The House Oversight Committee held a hearing yesterday to discuss food safety and other issues at the agency. The session covered lead-tainted cinnamon applesauce pouches, which left hundreds of children seriously ill last year. Florida-based Wanabana recalled the Ecuadorian product last fall after high concentrations of lead were discovered. Dr. Robert Califf said the FDA covers products from about 275,000 domestic and foreign manufacturers. Califf said food manufacturers often test their products themselves due to budget constraints at the agency. And the Dallas Police Department says Kansas City Chiefs receiver Rashi Rice turned himself in Thursday evening. He posted a $40,000 bond not long after. The 23-year-old's surrender comes after police issued an arrest warrant for him. He is accused of being involved in a six-car chain reaction crash last month and fleeing the scene. No one was killed, but four people were treated for injuries. Rice faces multiple counts, including aggravated assault and collision involving injury. So far, no word yet from Rice's attorney. And aside from the pristine beaches and beautiful waterfalls, Visitors to Maui, often taken by another natural wonder there, it's the magnificent 150-year-old banyan tree in the center of Lahaina. One of the biggest questions people asked after the devastating fire there eight months ago was, will the tree survive? Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources said Thursday the tree is continuing to show signs of recovery. That's despite about 40% of it that had to be cut down. But as you can see, it's growing leaves and providing shade. Arborists are using electronic sensors placed on the tree to monitor its progress. Up ahead, Russian military instructors reportedly active in the African country of Niger this week. This comes as African nations are increasingly turning away from the West. Labor unions in Italy on strike this week, calling for increased workplace safety. This after a deadly blast killed at least five workers at a power plant. And San Francisco looking to deepen ties with the communist Chinese regime. More on the, Mayorkas trip, on the mayor's trip to China after the break. Presenting the heritage of traditional Chinese martial arts, fostering martial ethics and reviving the true tradition. The preliminaries for the 2024 NTD International Traditional Martial Arts Competition will be held across New York, Taiwan, and Germany. The Grand Finals will be broadcast live online worldwide in August 2024. For more information, please call 1-888-477-9228. Every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. Shen Hyun.
Coming to Lincoln Center, April 3rd through the 14th. Buy tickets now at ShenYun.com. No young person should ever have to worry about having a safe place to sleep at night or a warm meal to eat or whether anyone cares about them. I grew up um, in poverty and I actually came physically homeless uh, right after I had turned 16. I didn't have anywhere to sleep and I didn't really have uh, friends or family that could support me. To be homeless as a teen, I didn't ask for that. One in 10 young adults will experience a form of homelessness this year, and that's unacceptable. But the good news is there is an organization making a big difference, Covenant House. For the young people who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations, Covenant House is there providing safety, hope, and a brighter future. Call or go online now for a gift of only $19 a month just 63 cents a day, you can provide hot meals, safe shelter, medical care, and love. For over 50 years, Covenant House has been helping youth in crisis and giving them the support and tools they need to succeed in life. Without the Covenant House, I honestly could not tell you where I would be today. Call or go online right now to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. With your monthly donation, you'll receive this soft, comforting blanket as a reminder of the warmth and safety your gift will provide a young person tonight. I would not be here today if it weren't for the kindness of strangers, people who donated to Covenant House so that they could support me when I couldn't support myself. I have no words to express how Covenant House changed my life. Your monthly gift is urgently needed to reach young people in communities like yours who didn't ask to be put in unthinkable situations. Your support makes the work of Covenant House possible. Call or go online to safeplacetosleep.org with your gift of just $19 a month. Hi, I'm Kelly Wright. We thank you for joining us and watching America's Hope here on NTD News. Bottom line is, I know you're sick and tired of being sick and tired, but let's give you some good news in the midst of the bad news. Watch us nightly right here on NTD News for a full dose of America's hope. Welcome back. The House today advanced a modified version of a bill to reauthorize Section 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, better known as FISA. Our correspondent, Luis Martinez, is on Capitol Hill. Luis, well, good to see you. What can you tell us? Well, of course, today, as you just mentioned, uh, the Congress is trying, the House of Representatives is debating right now as we speak amendments on the Reforming Intelligence and Securing America Act, which is a bill that uh, looks to reauthorize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which allows intelligence agencies to surveil foreign nationals, even though, even if those uh, foreign nationals are having communications with Americans. So this is the fourth time the House of Representatives attempts to reauthorize this bill. Earlier this morning, around 9.20 a.m., the House approved a rule vote that had failed on Tuesday uh, after a compromise solution among uh, House Republicans reduced the authorization from five to two years. Let's listen to what House Republicans had to say about these amendments. When it comes to the bill, obviously, if it doesn't have the warrant provisions in there, I won't support a bill that's going to continue to violate Fourth Amendment rights. It's 56 reforms in it that are important, some real teeth uh, to, to kind of get a handle on what the three-letter agencies have been doing, spying on the American people. And so right now... So right now, uh, in the House of Representatives, they're voting on an amendment uh, presented by Representative Andy Biggs of Arizona. That amendment requires a warrant uh, for U.S. intelligence agencies to collect, incidentally collect American citizens' data while intercepting communications of foreign nationals abroad. It's very interesting because now we can see congressmen from the left flank of the Democratic uh, party like Jarrett Nattler uh, agreeing with conservatives from the right flank of the conservative uh, uh, party like Congressman Jim Jordan. Let's listen to what Democrats had to say about these amendments. 
I think it's important for us to pass the amendment uh, that is supported uh, heavily by many progressives as well as actual uh, conservatives. It's a bipartisan amendment. I'm okay with the amendments that will guarantee that uh, the FBI and other law enforcement and intelligence agency will not be searching through our garbage uh, without a warrant. So the rule vote that failed on Tuesday was because 19 Republicans, mainly Freedom Caucus members, voted against that rule vote on Tuesday. Today, those Freedom Caucus members supported the procedural vote that happened at 9.30 this morning. I spoke earlier with Representative Bob Good, the chairman of the Freedom Caucus, and this is how he defended the change in stance of the Freedom Caucus members. Let's listen to Bob Good. It was a win to go to two years instead of five years, which is what we accomplished with voting against the rule a couple of days ago, because that means hopefully a new government, a new White House, a new Senate, and hopefully a House majority will have a chance to reform the bill even further to protect Americans' constitutional liberties. In addition, we got some commitments on a fair vote on uh, Andy Biggs's amendment uh, requiring a warrant to surveil U.S. citizens. and. Uh, Warren Davidson's amendment to prohibit the federal government from purchasing data that they would otherwise have to get a warrant for. Those are wins. Those amendments that Congressman Bob Good is referring to are the amendments that require a warrant for the incidental collection of Americans' data while U.S. intelligence agencies are uh, surveilling, spying on foreign nationals abroad. It remains to be seen if that amendment will be passed, and thus it also remains to be seen if uh, conservatives on the right flank of the Republican Party and progressives on the left flank of the Democratic Party will support the reforming intelligence and securing America act without the warrant amendment. Back to you. All right, Luis Martinez uh, reporting live from Washington, D.C. Thank you for that report on getting uh, you know, comments from both sides of the, of the aisle. We pre appreciate it. A Chinese university in downtown San Francisco. That's one of the aims of San Francisco Mayor London Breed, who is heading to China for a week. She says she wants to help San Francisco's economy and tourism recover from the pandemic. Breed is also advocating for more direct flights from China and to China and to have pandas, pandas sent to the San Francisco Zoo. The trip aims to boost tourism from the communist nation, which dropped during the pandemic. Breed hopes it will also improve her relationship with Chinese American voters who have expressed dissatisfaction with her performance. She plans to meet with Chinese businesses in Fudan University to discuss a campus in San Francisco. The trip funded by private donations, includes around 30 San Francisco leaders. And speaking of the pandemic, newly disclosed emails show U.S. health authorities' ties to the Chinese lab in Wuhan. A top advisor to Dr. Anthony Fauci messaged a zoologist who funneled money to the lab. Emails show that Dr. David Morens, the advisor, sent at least four messages to Peter Zak, a British zoologist who's also the president of EcoHealth Alliance. The emails were sent in April 2020, July 2020, and February 2022 using Morin's personal email account. They were about a grant from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases to EcoHealth to study bat coronaviruses. EcoHealth funneled money from that grant to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's the lab under scrutiny for potentially being the origin of COVID-19. The grants have since been suspended. The House Select Subcommittee on the Coronavirus Pandemic released the new emails yesterday saying they came from a whistleblower. Chair of the committee, Congressman Brad Wenstrup, said the emails show, quote, further attempts by Dr. Morins to subvert public transparency. Pressure is growing on the Biden administration to block additional flights to and from China. Two lawmakers plus Delta, United and American Airlines wrote letters to the U.S. Secretaries of State and Transportation. They asked the administration to be cautious about approving more flights between the two countries because of China's unfair market practice. The lawmakers are Representatives Mike Gallagher and Rajna Krishnamurthy, the chair and ranking member of the House Select China Committee. They said China effectively closed its aviation market to U.S. carriers during COVID. U.S. carriers have limited access to the Chinese aviation market. Plus, there are challenging rules that affect operations. The airline said the U.S. government needs to establish a policy to protect the aviation industry. 
A show of force aimed at China. The U.S., Japan, and South Korea wrapping up a three-day drill in the East China Sea today. The exercises got underway as President Biden hosted leaders of Japan and the Philippines. Their conversation focused on Beijing's rising aggression in disputed waters. I would once again just reiterate that uh, the United States, working with our allies in the regions, that uh, South Korea and uh, Japan are well prepared, well postured to defend ourselves and to defend our, defend our allies. The exercises involved a number of U.S. and South Korean missile destroyers and a Japanese warship. This comes after China's rising aggression in the South China Sea. Chinese Coast Guard ships have rammed Filipino boats, fired water cannons at them, and directed lasers at their crew members, all because of territory disputes. Top officials from the U.S. and Philippines are meeting at the State Department. Top on their agenda is the dispute over the South China Sea. But uh, more importantly is we, we are determined to uh, assert our sovereign rights, especially within our economic, uh, exclusive economic zone, uh, and in accordance with the uh, UNCLOS and the arbitral ruling. The meeting includes defense and foreign secretaries from the two countries and their national security advisors. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said the U.S. is in lockstep with the Philippines against coercion in the South China Sea. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the two nations have shared a commitment to a free and open Indo-Pacific, including in the South China Sea. The meeting came a day after the leaders of the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines met at the White House. H hours earlier, the Chinese regime summoned Japanese and Philippine diplomats to express dissatisfaction over the Thursday summit. And shifting gears, we have some short headlines from Russia, Italy, and other European countries. Russia is reportedly sending military instructors to the African country of Niger. That's according to Niger State Television, RTN. The channel reports that the instructors landed in Africa on Wednesday in a plane loaded with military equipment. This is part of an agreement between Niger and Russia to boost cooperation. Since the 2023 coup, Niger's military has kicked out French and European forces. It's turning away from the West and instead strengthening military ties with Russia. Historic floods in Russia and Kazakhstan continue impacting the lives of thousands of people. Today, authorities in the Russian city of Orenburg called for the mass evacuation of residents. Floodwaters keep rising as major rivers burst their banks. That's mostly due to huge masses of melting snow. Almost 100,000 people had to evacuate in Kazakhstan. Authorities have declared a state of emergency in 10 out of 17 regions in the country. The level of the Ural River in Orenburg has reached around 37 feet. The deputy mayor says the flood should reach its peak today and start subsiding in two days' time. Suspected Russian interference in Europe's elections in June. The Belgian intelligence service has confirmed the existence of a network trying to undermine support for Ukraine. The country's prime minister announced an investigation into Russia's alleged plans. Pro-Russian agents have allegedly been seeking to influence and even pay European lawmakers. That's so they promote a pro-Russian agenda. Europe-wide polls are being held in early June to elect a new EU parliament. Italian labor unions went on strike on Thursday. They're demanding more safety measures at the workplace. This comes after a deadly explosion at a hydro plant that killed at least five people. Ba adesso basta. Enough now, not only deaths at work, enough now. We can't stand this anymore. The killings are increasing and getting closer and closer to each other. The largest demonstration was held in Bologna. More protests took place in Turin, Naples and Perugia. Tuesday's explosion shook the plant more than 100 feet below the water level. This caused flooding and the collapse of part of the nine-story underground structure. Coming up, will Tom Brady make a comeback? The seven-time Super Bowl champion left the door open with his latest retirement comments. And today's Dave Martin joins us to discuss. A spelling contest in front of the Eiffel Tower. French people share their experience and their love for words. More shortly, here on NTD News Today. Does shopping for bladder control products have you feeling like you need someone to be on the lookout for you? Now you have your privacy back. 
We're HDIS, and we home deliver bladder control products directly to you. We're always on the lookout for you. You get free shipping in plain, unmarked boxes. So your private matters stay private. We understand how you feel. For over 35 years, we've delivered bladder control products to millions of Americans, just like you. You don't have to worry about incontinence any longer. Call now for your free product sample pack and over $45 in money-saving coupons. At HDIS, we're always in stock. We carry all brands in hundreds of styles and sizes. You'll be sure to get what you need, guaranteed. For your free sample pack with your free catalog and $45 in money-saving coupons and free product samples, call 800-701-6159. That's 800-701-6159. If you're buzzed and doing this, to make yourself feel okay to drive, ZWX. You're not okay to drive. Y G K L V W. Uh, regular you. How'd it happen? She showed up dead on arrival. This never gets easier. It does when you call Car Shield before your car breaks down. Look at these prices. The camshaft, transmission, engine. Don't people know? A plan through Car Shield could protect up to 5,000 parts and systems. You hate to see it. An out of warranty car is gonna break down eventually. Right, which is why they need a plan through Car Shield. Those expensive repair bills get paid and at the mechanic of their choice. They're notifying the family. Poor guy, he doesn't even know what's coming. Another victim of senselessly expensive repair bills. Can't save them all. But we can keep trying. Mm. Didn't have to end this way. If he'd have just called Car Shield before his car broke down. <sighs> exactly. Protect yourself from the unprecedented rise in cost for parts and repairs. Call now to save money with your price lock guarantee. Call 800-429-5128. These are all farmers, maybe no, not this not one, a farm anymore. but here is a farm, right? No, there's also not a farm anymore. All these people shut down because of the government policies? Yeah. The government wants to control the food, so we don't eat meat, but we eat insect. As the price of staples goes through the roof, people will say, I can't afford a steak anymore. So, all right, I'll, just, I'll eat your stupid crickets. For the day's top headlines and the news you need to know, tune in right here to NTD Evening News. Welcome back, and now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Hey Dave, it's good to see you, so there's a lot to cover today, uh, but let's start with golf. So the Masters begins their second round today, but um, Tiger Woods, despite all his injuries, he's still playing. I mean, how's he doing? He did well yesterday. He shot a one under through 13 holes. Now play was suspended at that point because of darkness when play resumed this morning. Unfortunately, he bogeyed two of the five holes that, uh, that were remaining. So then he, he was a one over uh, par for the round. That was that put him in a tie for 36th place, but that's out of 89 players, though. So he's actually on pace still to make the weekend cut, which is really remarkable considering all of his injuries. I mean, since that car accident three years ago that almost cost him his leg, he's played in just six PGA events. He's only finished two of them. Now, if he does make the weekend cut, he would actually set a record with his 24th straight Masters cut and at least give him a he would at least give him himself a shot uh, of winning. I mean, he raised some eyebrows this week when he said he thought he could win another Masters if everything came together. Now, the second round is already underway, and Woods is currently one over par through seven holes. Okay, Dave shifting gears to baseball. The former interpreter for Shohei Otani is now being charged with federal bank fraud. How devastating is this whole situation? How much money has he allegedly stolen? 16 million dollars that's at this that's at this point and i say that because when this story first broke a few weeks ago it was 
reported that it was at four and a half million. So the details keep coming out. And this is allegedly from Otani, and all of it apparently was used to cover his gambling debts. Now, also according to the complaint against him, the former interpreter, this is Ipe Mutsuhara, there were 19,000 bets placed with a particular bookie over a two and a half year period. That's an average of 25 a day. I mean, I don't even know how someone has that much time on their hands, to be honest with you. In any case, his alleged winnings were a little like 142 million, but his alleged losses, 183 million. So that's a difference of a net loss of more than $40 million. So it's a pretty sad case of why not to gamble. I mean, it's addicting for one thing, and once you get in your over your head in debt. I mean, if you try to gamble your way out of that, you know, good luck. Bookmakers do not get in this business to lose money. That means their clients do. So anyway, it's a pretty serious case uh, for his interpreter, former interpreter, I should say. Right, and he's been in the news um, uh, previously before as well. Now, um, so let's uh, touch down on the football scene. So Tom Brady made some interesting comments uh, yesterday, he said he wouldn't be opposed to a late season return to the NFL. So what do you make of this? Do you think he'll uh, have a comeback here? No. I mean, he had so many, he's had, he surely had opportunities last year to come back. He had opportunities to come back at the beginning or announce a comeback at the beginning of this offseason. He didn't do so. Uh, so I think he's had some chances already. If he was going to, he would have done it already. I'm actually a little baffled this made headlines today. I mean, I guess it is Tom Brady, but he'll be 47 when next season starts. I'm sure he's still in great shape, but when you take time off at this age, the list of players who've come back uh, is pretty short, for doing, at least coming back as their old self. I mean, Michael Jordan came back after three years in retirement. He, averaged, he still averaged more than 20 points a game. He was not his same self. Deion Sanders actually did the same. Three years off, and then he came back for two years with Baltimore. Reggie White, another Hall of Famer, did the same. He only took one year off. He was not the same when he came back. All those players that I mentioned also were are 10 year, roughly 10 years younger than Brady is right now. Uh, so I'm sure fans would love him back. He's left the door open, but I do not see it happening. Now, this does seem to be a recurring uh, theme with Tom Brady, but yeah, I look forward to seeing what happens there. Thanks so much, Dave. We'll, we'll get your take on that when it does. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> on this episode of Strong Mind and Body, we dive into the benefits of walking backward. Here's Gina Marie. Oh, wow. In this fast-paced world, forward is the direction we're told to go. But a surprisingly simple exercise encourages us to do the opposite, walk backward. More than just a fad, scientific evidence is suggesting it might be worth the awkward effort. Retro walking revives an ancient technique with origins in China. Dr. Michael Mosley highlighted its historical significance in a podcast. He said the Chinese have a saying that 100 steps backward are worth 100 steps forward. Over a century ago, Patrick Harmon made headlines. He walked backward from San Francisco to New York City. This ignited widespread fascination. Today, retro walking is endorsed by health enthusiasts and experts alike. Here are five benefits, starting with number one, improved balance. Retro walking emerges as a powerful tool for balance improvement. A small study revealed that retro walking participants experienced significant gains in balance, step length and walking speed. Number 2. Burn more calories Jordan Duncan is a sports chiropractor. He said that when we walk backward, our bodies aren't able to store and release energy to the extent that we do when walking forward. He said it makes it a great way to burn calories. Number 3. Strengthen muscles Retro walking actively engages and strengthens muscles in a way forward walking cannot. It demands more which can turn a simple stroll into a full-on lower body and core workout. Number 4. Reduces knee pain For knee rehabilitation, backward walking is becoming a go-to recommendation by medical professionals. Its effectiveness has been noted in knee osteoarthritis and post-knee replacement therapy cases. It exerts a softer impact on the knees, reducing stress and encouraging a fuller range of motion. And number five, challenges the brain. Engaging in reverse navigation compels our brains to adjust and forge new neural connections. This enhances mental alertness and improves cognitive capabilities. So here are a few tips to get you going. Begin cautiously with brief sessions in obstacle-free zones. Select appropriate shoes that offer comfort and support. Partner up to make it more enjoyable. Incorporate intervals, in other words, mix forward walking with retro walking into your routine. And finally, listen to your body.
In France, a special event taking place in front of the Eiffel Tower today. 2,500 participants of all ages took, took part in a spelling contest. Participants of all ages sat in armchairs under the bright sun, as you can see, emulating a traditional elementary school exercise. The spelling contest took place as part of the French capital's annual book fair. Yes, I think it's a nice moment, a moment of sharing, a moment to not take yourself too seriously. It's really nice. It's also about the love of words. I've never been that good in spelling, but I have a quite decent level compared to what is becoming of spelling. The contest featured an Olympics themes passage. This comes as the 100 day countdown to the games approaches. The Paris Olympics opens on July 26 and will run until August 11th. British police thought something was wrong with their car when they heard this crooning bird mimicking their siren sound. Listen. You can see here the footage shared by local police showing the bird perched in a tree, perfectly replicating the sound made by British police vehicles. In the social media post, police confirmed that the footage was 100% real and not a belated April Fool's joke. And it's that time of year again. National Park Week kicks off April 20th. To celebrate, entry fees to every national park in the country are waived that day. Special activities are also planned throughout the week. There are close to 430 sites within the National Park System, from national battlefields to seaside parks. The event runs from Saturday, April 20th to Sunday, April 28th. And for round-the-clock original news coverage, visit us at ntd.com or download our NTD app. And be sure to stick around for NTD Newsroom at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll cover more stories from the U.S. and around the world. And Chris will be back on Monday to co-host with Steph. And I'm heading back to California. It's been a pleasure delivering the news to everyone from our entity headquarters. Steph, it's been great working with you. And you're all in great hands. It's been great working with you too, David.